Um, I'm going to call the meeting of the Canby Planning Commission for June 14th, 2021. It is now in session, and uh, we'll start with the invocation. So, uh, Lord, we ask for your wisdom as we make some tough decisions this evening. Help us to carefully consider the relevant info, information that is put before us. Help us to wisely evaluate our options and help us come to the pe best possible decision for the citizens of Campy. Amen. And now we'll have the, the flag salute, Pledge of Allegiance. Are we ready to go? Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you all for being here this evening. I can't tell if we're really rolling yet. See a big three down there. Laney uh, or Eric, are we rolling? Recording in progress. Are we rolling on? Yeah, we've done the invocation. We've done the flag salute. Yep. Okay, good. Yep, yep we're good. Okay, so now we're going to have uh, any citizen input on non-agenda items. Do we have any of that, uh, Eric, that you know of? Uh, I'm not aware of any citizen input on non-agenda items. Okay. There are no minutes to review. Uh, no new business. And so we'll move right into the public hearing uh, for number one. And so there will be, I don't know if there will be people uh, testifying on this uh, for or against, but if you are, please, uh, when you speak, just state your name and address and uh, and whether you're pro or con. So our first one is going to be uh, can be utility, a major variance, city file number VAR 21-03. And we are going to consider a proposal from can be utility uh, requesting the planning commission approve a major variance to construct a 10 foot tall security fence as part of phase two of their previously approved project DR-17-01, which is currently under construction. The proposed fence height is two feet above the maximum allowed in the M1 or the light industrial zone by the city's zoning code. Okay, so uh, let's see. There, tonight there's a matter before the hearing body that requires public hearings. All questions must be directed through the chair. Any evidence to be considered must be submitted to the hearing body for public access. All written testimony received both for and against shall be summarized by staff and presented briefly to the hearing body during the staff report. Testimony and evidence must be directed toward the ethical review criteria contained in the staff report. The comprehensive plan or other land use regulations which the person believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. At this time, I would ask that any member of the hearing body who has a conflict of interest Please indicate the nature and extent of the conflict and whether you intend to participate in or abstain from hearing the present matter. Okay, 
Uh, also, if any member of the hearing body has had any ex parte contact with anyone prior to this hearing, including a visit to the site, please declare the nature and extent of such contact at this time. Okay. Um, does any member of the audience have any questions for any counselor or uh, uh, regarding ex parte contact or conflict of interest? Okay. The uh, public hearing will be conducted as follows. Uh, first, we will have the staff report and then any questions uh, from the commissioners if, if necessary. I will uh, then open the uh, public hearing for testimony. The applicant will have not more than 15 minutes. Um, proponents, not more than five minutes, or excuse me, three minutes. Opponents, not more than three minutes. And rebuttal uh, by the applicant, not more than 10 minutes if necessary. That time, uh, the chair will close that, will close the public hearing. And there will be questions if any, but any by the other commissioners. The decision will be made uh, by the uh, commissioners at the close of the hearing, or the matter will be continued to a date certain in the future. This will be the only notice of that date you will receive. Are there any questions? Okay, let's get started. Um, staff report, who's giving the staff report this evening? Good evening, Chair Savory. This is Ryan Potter. Can you oh, hear me okay? You bet. Good, good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, can everyone see the slideshow? Um, it should be on the Canby Utility Phase 2 slide. I can. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start. So, uh, good evening, uh, Chair Savory and members of the Planning Commission. Um, tonight um, is a major variance, uh, is our first item. This is for Canby Utilities, uh, phase two of their uh, new headquarters that they're um, built, currently building the, the second phase of um, on the south side of town. So this first slide is just a reminder that um, the ap applicable criteria that are analyzed in the staff report um, come directly from our municipal code. Um, in this case is just a couple uh, provisions. Um, the first is our general provisions section, which includes uh, fence height regulations. Um, the second is the light industrial zone, which is um, the zone that this uh, property is located in. And then the third is our variance uh, procedures and criteria. Um, so most people in town are pretty familiar with this um, parcel. Um, this is Canby Utilities' new building. Um, this was a project that was a, approved in 2017. And so the first uh, phase was built and has been open for a couple of years. That's the office that's on the, the front portion. Um, and then Canby's currently building their second phase, which is the back portion, um, which is where all their maintenance and um, outdoor storage yard and um, all those ancillary uh, activities that they do as they're building our infrastructure around town. So the, the parcel is zoned for light industrial uses. Um, and then I guess the, the rest I already went over. So the proposed project is just a um, small change in the height of the fence that can be utility would like to put on the security fence around the the front um, facade on Pine Street. Um, so th there's really no changes to the land use or the buildings proposed. Um, this is something of a technicality. So when the project was originally approved, um, our code was a little bit ambiguous on fence heights in this zone. It said something to the effect of the Planning Commission may require up to eight feet. Um, after the project was uh, approved, um, many of you remember we had a whole package of code updates that cleaned up a lot of items. One of the items happened to be the language um, that this provision came out of, and it clarified it to say um, a fence up to eight feet is allowed. So, um, 
Part of the reasoning for this uh, taller fence that Canby Utilities is, is looking to construct um, is when they were constru constructing the first phase, they had some theft issues um, on their site. And so at the time, a 10 foot fence wasn't um, prohibited. And so that first phase has a semi-transparent wire mesh uh, 10 foot tall fence. Now that they're coming back and building the second phase, our codes change. So they'd like to build a fence that matches the one um, on the first, uh, the first phase. Um, the, only re the main reason why this is a little complicated is because when the first, uh, when the original land use approval came through, um, it didn't really uh, get into 10 foot fences. So this is, we're just um, trying to do the right thing, make sure we do everything by the book here. And can so Canby Utility has come through um, requesting a variance to match for the fence in the second phase to match that in the first phase. So um, these are a couple of pictures of the ones that are already built. And then this diagram just shows where um, the new ones would be um, located if the variance is approved. So you can see the, the blue lines are the ones that have already been built over by the office building. And then the red ones are um, the ones that would be located in front of the second phase along Pine Street, you can see there's two layers that one closer to the street would be lower um, and kind of um, boxes in the stormwater basin that'll be the little strip stormwater basin. The taller one would be in the back and it would have two 11 foot gates um, that are part of the 10 foot fence. And here's just a uh, elevation view of the proposed fence. So again, there's criteria that staff looked at when we were evaluating um, the proposed variance. Um, and then the main criteria come from our variance section. And so there's six um, lenses through which a variance is supposed to be evaluated. And I'll, and I'll just kind of summarize these. These are, these are in the staff report. Um, but perhaps most importantly, is there exceptional or extraordinary circumstances? In this case, Canby Utility is somewhat of a unique use in town because um, unlike a lot of light industrial uses, they're building essential um, infrastructure uh, here in town. So electrical service and water service are, are done by Canby Utility. So they have a lot of specialized um, and expensive equipment and materials that they store um, on their site, including uh, materials are used in emergencies and things like that. So it, it's a little bit unique in that they need to be able to really secure the things that are stored in their yard. Um, is it necessary to maintain similar property rights? Um, the, the fence is, is, is quite a small change to the overall design uh, of the, um, the use that's being built there. So it doesn't really give the um, the property owner, a, a unique property right uh, um, substantially beyond what another property owner in this zone would, would have. Um, it doesn't conflict with the comprehensive plan or zoning ordinance other than the, that specific eight foot limit. Um, it wouldn't hurt, uh, harm surrounding properties. Um, staff believes that uh, the, the fence has been designed to be um, as aesthetically pleasing as it could be. It's not a big, solid, massive wall. It's got some transparency to it. So it'll, um, it'll show some of the landscaping that's, that's in that area. Um, and uh, because there's residential uses over there um, along Pine Street, um, staff believes that this is a, a relatively tasteful uh, solution to the, the problem of keeping this uh, yard secure. Is it the minimum to alleviate the hardship? Um, our findings in the staff report find that, you know, the, the two feet of additional fence and then the, the additional foot for the gates above that it is really a relatively minor um, extension of what would normally be allowed. They're, they're not asking for a fence that's substantially larger um, than would be normally uh, allowed. And then um, the exceptional or unique conditions weren't caused by the applicant. And so this is, this is something that, you know, variances, it shouldn't be just, 
you get a variance just because you want one. You know, that that's usually what planners are looking at. And uh, staff do, don't believe that that's the case here. This is an essential part of um, the city's infrastructure and the entity that works on that infrastructure. Um, so can be utility sort of tasked um, with it, with this um, kind of special status in town of, of building something that uh, needs to be really secure. Um, so staff evaluated um, the variance based on those criteria. Um, we only had one condition and that was just that um, planning staff would like to see a, a final um, site plan showing the final um, fence uh, elevation drawing and the site plan. We, we have received one from the applicant, but just in case anything changes, we need to see that because the, the Clackamas County is the entity that um, releases uh, building permits. But before they do that, um, they need a, a site plan release letter from the city of Canby. And so this condition of approval is just kind of memorializing that we need the, um, that finalized site plan. We, um, there was a public notice that went out um, to property owners within a 200 foot radius of the project site. Um, I only received one comment and this was just a neighboring property owner that was just curious um, about the location and the height of the proposed fence. So based on the conclusions of the staff report and the, and the um, discussion I just um, went through, um, staff are recommending that the Planning Commission approve application variance 21-03. Okay, thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> Let me make sure that I'm still... Oh, okay. So thank you, Ryan, for outlining that. Uh, are there any questions uh, that you would like to direct, the commissioners would like to direct to Ryan? Um, Commissioner Mills? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have no questions. Great. Uh, Commissioner Trendy? Sorry, my unmute didn't want to work. Uh, no, I don't have any questions. Great report there. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Commissioner Heap? Uh, no, no, not really any questions. I. Uh, okay understand it, familiar with the area. So. Uh, Commissioner Boatwright. Nope, no questions, John. Okay, uh, Commissioner Patton. No questions, it's all pretty straightforward. It is, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other proponents, or no, we have the applicant, excuse me. So we have, uh, who is going to represent the applicant? Eric? I, I believe we have Brian. I Hopefully, I don't screw your name up. Ferreccione? <laughs> we'll give it to you. Close enough. <laughs> yeah. Go, go okay. ahead. Okay. If you could state, uh, e as you each of you speak, could you state your name and address, please? <clears throat> yes. Hello there. Good evening. My name is Brian Ferreccione. I am a planner at McKenzie. Um, and Mackenzie's address is 1515 Southeast Water Avenue, Suite 100 in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and I'm joined by Adam Olson. Adam? Um, Adam is also at Mackenzie, and he's an architect and the project manager for this, this project. Um, and so same address. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, thank, thank you for your time. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak before you this evening, as well as all the time that staff took uh, leading up to this hearing. Um, as as you, you may have gathered, there have been a number of commissions, uh, a number of questions before the hearing um, with Ryan and with Don, as we tried to work our way through the code provisions, um, figure out what they said three years ago when this approved, was approved, what they say today, et cetera. And, and finally, we settled on the path forward. Um, so as, as Ryan noted, this project overall was approved uh, back in 2017, and it was a, a two-phase project. 
the first phase being the office portion at the northern end of the site. Um, and the idea at that time was uh, the utility board thought, you know, phase two might be, I don't know, five, eight, 10 years down the road. Um, but um, turns out phase two is much sooner than that. So here we are just, just a few years after the original approval coming back in front of you, uh, requesting a fairly minor update uh, to the fence site. And as Ryan noted, the, the reasoning behind that is um, some thefts that occurred during the construction of phase one. Um, the contractor at that time uh, experienced a break-in or two and a, a bunch of uh, their valuable equipment and office um, materials were stolen. And so the Canby Utility Board thought it would be prudent to secure the site uh, with a 10-foot fence to prevent any sort of similar um, actions for, for their facility. Um, up until now, it's just been the, the office workers. Um, so not really um, a lot of inventory or high value uh, storage, but that's changing with phase two, which will have um, outdoor storage of uh, materials and equipment, but also have um, um, canopy coverage over vehicle parking areas for the specialized utility equipment um, and then there's a maintenance and storage building as well. So it'll be a, a pretty significant addition to the site, both in terms of new buildings, as well as uh, increase in value of materials that are stored on there. And so what the Canby Utility Board is requesting, and we're doing so on their behalf this evening, is um, variance approval to increase the fence height, um, specifically just along Southeast Pine Street, because as Ryan showed you in that earlier diagram, there's some existing uh, fencing that's already over 10 feet and that would remain unchanged. Um, and then two of the property lines that abut other parcels to the east and to the south, there's already existing chain link fencing. I don't know the height, but I'm assuming that's somewhere around eight feet or so. Um, and the Canby Utility Board isn't proposing any changes um, to that existing fencing. So it's just the part facing Pine Street um, most of it will be 10 feet, the gates are a foot higher, and that's just because of the geometry. Um, the top, the fence comes up and then it angles at the top. And so if in order for the gate to slide back behind the, um, the main fence, it needs to be a little bit taller so that it doesn't, um, <laughs> so it doesn't crash into each other and break everything. Um, so... That's, that's the reasoning and what's proposed. Um, you know, I, I know that we made sure to coordinate with staff and, and, and provide evidence demonstrating that the variance approval criteria are satisfied. And I believe we've satisfied the burden of proof on that. But a couple of other things I wanted to mention were, um, you know, I know that many planning commissions and cities in general can be a little bit concerned about precedent. You know, if, if this variance is granted today, what does that mean for other property owners in the future? Uh, and so my comments on that are, you know, one, that variances are specific to the property. Uh, they're not generally applicable across the zone or anything like that. Um, and two, this is, this is a very unique uh, type of user. So, you know, how many water and electrical utility providers are there in Canby? Well, it turns out there's just one. <laughs> so they're the only ones requesting uh, this special dispensation. Um, and it's not a set of circumstances that would be generally applicable to other sites in the city. Um, so just wanted to uh, put people at ease about that, that, uh, you know, granting this variance won't be something that uh, opens the floodgates and suddenly you have um, a whole bunch of fences. Uh, and then the final point that Ryan mentioned, but I'll reiterate, was just about the, the aesthetic design. Um, it's not a chain link fence that's uh, just galvanized gray or anything. It's, a, it's, a, it's an attractive welded wire black fence, um, no barbed wire or anything on that. And the design is uh, tasteful and complementary to the surroundings. So uh, with that, we would uh, request the Planning Commission support for this application. Uh, and then Adam and I are both available for any questions that you might have. 
you, <coughs> excuse me. Are there any questions for um, any of the commissions at this time? No question here. Okay. No. Thank you. Uh, okay, we'll move along. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, are there uh, any other proponents uh, that you know of, Eric, to speak in favor of this project? I'm not aware of any other proponents. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not aware of any proponents or opponents. Sure. Sam. Okay. Um, are there at then are there any people that you know of that are here this evening to oppose the project? No. Okay. In that case, I don't. I'm assuming that there is no need for rebuttal, since no nothing to rebut. So at this time, I will close the public hearing, and um, if there are any questions for follow-up questions by for staff or for the applicant. Uh, by any commissioners, now would be the time to address that. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily have uh, uh, any questions. I do have a comment, though, as before we do hold the vote. I, I'm i probably going to be in favor of it because, uh, yeah, it is protecting our, our uh, essential infrastructure, which is unique in the city of Canby, and the need for the added security and uh, the need to keep the cost low uh, for you know, residents by not having any theft. So yeah, I think it's a good idea to have these fences, but that was it. Okay, thank you. Um, then we will um, make a decision. So we'll start with uh, Commissioner Mills. Um, what are your thoughts and how are you gonna, how are you gonna vote on this? Um, I would just like to echo what Commissioner Heba just uh, pretty effectively summarized. I think um, it's a reasonable uh, request, especially given the uh, relatively unique circumstances, and uh, I'm going to support it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Trendy. I think it was well presented. It makes a lot of sense, and I'm going to support it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner um, Patton. I too will be supporting it. It makes complete sense. Uh, the one thing that did come to mind was um, now that that eight foot is set for these areas, maybe it would behoove the uh, the department to look at any other granted camp utility as a special sort of circumstance here, but any other similar industries that are in these zone types that may look at do following suit and, and putting up a larger fence to, to secure their property. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, at this time, I will entertain a motion to approve, bear with me for just a second, to approve um, the variance to construct a 10 foot tall security fence as part of phase two of the Canby Utilities previously approved project DR 17 01. Um, so I, I move enter. to approve. Um, I can't remember the number now. VR. DR 17 01. Thank you. DR 17 01. Okay, uh, thank you. We have a second. Mr. Chair, I think it's actually VAR 2103. Yes, that's yeah. that's correct. Uh, Just Commissioner Mills. Oh. Uh, the 17 one was the, the original. Link. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm, I am sorry that you're right. So let's, uh, let's start over again with that <laughs> Good catch there. I don't know. I was just reading down on this thing. Well, first, first we, we have a motion on the table that's been seconded. So we probably should fail that motion and then make a new one. Okay. All in favor of not <laughs> of going back and revising our our uh, statement for DR 17-01, say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. So let me rephrase that. I will now entertain a motion to approve um, Canby Utility Major Variance uh, VAR 21-03. 
I move to approve VAR 21-03. And do I have a second? Seconded. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 And it sounds like the dog voted too. Well, you know, that's always the important part. It's kind of a critical factor in our decision making. Well, that's why I stay so muted because my dog's very vocal. Yeah. Well, my little Frenchies aren't at quite as vocal. They're they're sleeping. They're they're good little ham rolls. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will move on to our second um, matter at hand, uh, which is the State Street Multifamily Project City File DR twenty one dash zero four and. Uh, Hold on just a second here. So that is um, right. Multifamily DNS. Okay. So we will to con we are considering a site and design review application to develop two buildings with 12 residential units totaling approximately 10,588 square feet on a 0.44 acre site. The proposed development will be accessed off of Southwest Third Avenue by the means of an existing easement. Both buildings will be three stories in height, approximately 5,294.25 uh, square feet. The proposal is to have a total of six two bedroom, two bathroom units and six one bedroom, one bathroom unit and each individual multifamily structure, structure will have a total of six units with a mixture of one and two bedroom units. So, um, Ryan, are you going to be giving us the staff report this evening on that? Uh, no, it's going to be me, Eric Forsell. Okay. okay, Eric. Uh, so, good oh. evening. Oh. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, I, I, I suppose I suppose I should read the uh, yeah public hearing format first. I'm sorry. Well, it's been a while. I'm a little rusty. So, um, so tonight there is a matter before the hearing body that requires a public hearing. All questions must be directed through the chair. Any evidence to be considered must be submitted to the hearing body for public access. All written testimony received both for and again shall be summarized by staff and presented briefly to the hearing body during the staff report. Testimony and evidence must be directed toward the applicable review criteria contained in the staff report, the comprehensive plan or other land use regulations, which the person believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence uh, sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. At this time, I would ask that any member of the hearing body who has a conflict of interest, please indicate the nature and extent of the conflict and whether you intend to participate in or abstain from hearing the present matter. Yeah. This is Commissioner Heeb. Uh, I don't have any conflict of interest, but I did uh, have, a, I guess, what would be ex parte contact. I uh, drove by to look at the uh, the property in question and uh, briefly spoke to a neighbor in the area, but I, yeah, not a, nothing that I consider conflict of interest and I plan to proceed tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else? Yeah, John, this is Larry Boatwright. I, too, went by the area, stopped to check it out, and I talked to the neighbor to the west named Patty Fifield. Okay. I intend to participate. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Also, so that's the ex parte conflict. Okay. So... Um, does any member of the audience have any questions for any counselor uh, or commissioner regarding ex parte contact or conflict of interest? Okay, then we'll proceed. Uh, first, we'll go with the staff report. I believe that's you, Eric. 
That's me. Uh, again, mm-hmm. my name's Eric Forso. I work with the city of Canby planning department. And then tonight we have our second item, which is the state street project city file DR 21 dash zero four. This meeting was originally scheduled for May 10th last month. Um, the applicant requested a continuance to this date. So that's why we're hearing it today. Uh, they wanted to address some of the public comments they had received and to conduct a traffic analysis. So um, this is that continued hearing. As you had mentioned, uh, Chair Savory, the applicant is requesting approval to develop the site uh, with a multifamily 12 residential unit project. Uh, the site is about 0.44 acres in size, roughly rectangular. Um, it contains some existing grass and a few mature trees. There's an existing structure on the site, which is proposed to be demolished to accommodate the development. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but it's approximately 0.44 acres. And that was, I believe, post property line adjustment. Um, the mix between units is, so there's gonna be six two bedroom total, six one bedroom total. Um, my understanding from the applicant submittal is that those will be evenly split between two buildings. So it'll be three two bedrooms and three one bedrooms per structure. Um, the development itself is gonna to propose to be accessed off of Southwest Third Avenue by the, the means of an existing easement. Um, originally the easement was 20 feet wide. The applicant uh, was able to secure additional easement area. And that was also uh, I believe in concert with a property line adjustment. That file was lot line adjustment 21-01 and that was approved um, early this year. Both of the structures are proposed to be three stories in height and approximately 5,300 square feet in size. Uh, I think especially for this type of project, it's good to zoom out and give a little context. Um, I know that there was uh, significant interest in this project. There's concerns about the compatibility or lack thereof, and um, even why an applicant is proposing to construct three-story apartment structures here. The first thing that I think is important to note here is that the subject property itself and much of the surrounding area have been zoned high density residential, which is R2, since at least 1980. Um, and that's over 30 years. Uh, the reason I, I say that is that this these properties have been zoned for this type of use for a long time. Um, it didn't happen recently and it's something that's been in place, something that was acknowledged and adopted by the state when we went through a comprehensive plan acknowledgement process and all communities in the state of Oregon need to accommodate some form of high density residential development. The, this area has a lot of R2 zoning. So that's kind of the base of why we're here. Um, if this property was not zoned R2, we would not have apartments here. Uh, I know that seems somewhat elementary, but it it is important to consider that, you know, this wasn't a, a, a situation where this property was rezoned to R2 a couple of years ago, and now we're, we're coming in for apartments. Um, so that being said, what does an R2 zone mean? It means that we need a density of 14 units per acre. Typically how that's achieved is through apartments. Um, 
Sometimes it can be through townhouses or other types of development, but that's generally how you are able, one is able to achieve a density of 14 units per acre. So that's a minimum, um, that's a minimum requirement. And there is no maximum density for this. Um, and that and on its face may sound strange, but how that actually works out is that the maximum density is mitigated by a variety of factors. Some of those are the setbacks. Some of them are the coverage area or the impervious area, the height standards, parking, landscaping. All of those things eventually eat into your developable area. So um, the ability to get real high density way beyond 14 units per acre is generally not possible. So there is kind of a cap that happens with those factors. Um, the other interesting aspect of this project is that it does avoid uh, the demolition of the existing structures to the property adjacent. Uh, it saves an existing single family home that uh, does appear to be of some uh, architectural or historical character. Uh, I know that in the beginning of this, there was discussion of both these parcels being sold together. Uh, for whatever reason, that didn't materialize. So the applicant has this existing parcel, which is to the rear of the one that contains the home. So just for reference, um, I figured I would show this to you all. This is a building permit. This is for 285 Southwest 3rd Avenue. Um, this is the uh, property directly adjacent. So the building permit, R2 zone, um, they were building a new garage with this one. And that, uh, I believe, is the garage that is going to be demolished in this, if this were to gain approval. So here's the date, uh, 4-23-1980, um, in that red box. Uh, not, I mean, I, not to uh, try to intend that you would, one would not believe that these uh, properties were zoned R2 since 1980, but here is um, an example of one of the pieces of documentation that demonstrate that aspect. Eric, I have a quick question before I lose my place. Okay. This permit I'm assuming is part of a digitized record or did you have to hunt this down? I scanned this from a paper record. So you hunted down this paper record in the old files? Correct. Okay, thank you. Ideally, all of our stuff would be digitized. Sometimes it's hit and miss. I like the paper records because I know that they're there. And I can find what I'm looking for. Sometimes stuff that I can't find that's digitized. But yes, this was a paper record that was subsequently scanned. Um, so continuing kind of on my general discussion here is, so we know that the property is zoned R2, high density residential. And we know that requires a minimum density in order to develop the property with new structures. Um, what what I want to make clear is that plant the planning department does is not the driver for development. We don't we're not out there asking people to come in and build apartment complexes. Um, sometimes people sometimes that gets confused. I, and planning is not an easy to understand concept for many people. Um, and I just want to be very clear that the planning department isn't driving this development. We are simply reviewing what comes into our office against the code. And the other part that's interesting and is part of really kind of how this is all unfolding is that, again, we have this R2 area. Market forces have basically come to the point where an R2 property is now profitable to construct a multifamily development. That may not have been the case 10 years ago, 
15 years ago, five years ago. Uh, I can only assume that the developer is choosing to do this because there's a profit involved with it. Um, at any rate, um, that's, you know, the, these properties were zoned R2 for 30 years. It seems somewhat shocking that these are coming in now, but they are coming in now. And one could only assume that it's probably because of a market driven force. Again, um, just kind of reiterating this is that we don't, we don't propose development. We review and provide recommendations based on the evidence and also staff understand and, uh, understand that all of all development is not desirable that this this project might not be desirable but again we're reviewing against criteria um, so that's how we make our decisions so uh, you know I, I apologize if that was elementary for some um, if you find that not to be useful but it's helpful for sometimes the public, sometimes for myself, sometimes for the commissioners, just to kind of frame the concept here. So the um, diving into what we look at in terms of approval criteria, uh, we look at 1608, which are the general provisions. They contain um, some code criteria related to traffic studies. We look at 1610, which is the amount of parking required for this type of project. 1620 is the R2 zone itself. So is an apartment complex allowed in an R2 zone and the density requirements. 1621 are the residential design standards. Those in this case uh, replace the standards in 16.49, which are the normal design standards. And that's only the case for multifamily projects. We also look at signs if they're proposed in 1642. Outdoor lighting standards, uh, access limitations, the design review process itself, and then the general standards and procedures by which we review these types of applications. So here is the subject property. It sounds like some of you are already uh, familiar with it. Um, the property itself is indicated by the star. That red dash line is the approximate location of where access would be provided across the property to the subject property. Uh, it's largely undeveloped. There is um, some, some larger trees and some other vegetation. Here is a map of the zone, zoning map. Um, again, the star subject property, dark orange is gonna be R2 high density residential. The lighter kind of whitish beige color is R1 low density residential. And that is um, important for some of the setback requirements. There are special standards for uh, R2 development adjacent to R1 development. So these were a little difficult to squeeze onto uh, the slide, but um, should be decent images. Um, this is the existing property, uh, existing conditions survey that was conducted by, I believe, Stutzner Engineering. I apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Uh, it shows a, uh, the lot line adjustment that I had mentioned earlier, where they had moved the original line to be a little further in the northerly direction. And then here we have uh, the applicants a preliminary site plan. You can see on the red arrow, there's a fire turnaround, which is also where the parking area is located. Um, 
a pretty typical kind of hammerhead turnaround for the fire department in the parking area. Um, there's the a 15 foot buffer, which is required for properties that are adjacent to R1. And I had mentioned previously, that's indicated by that blue arrow. That's an addition to um, the normal setbacks based on height for a three-story structure. And then the uh, green arrow is indicating the access area to the subject property. So uh, as I had mentioned in the beginning of uh, my presentation is that the applicant did ask for a continuance from our last meeting on May 10th. One of the primary drivers for that was to conduct a traffic analysis. Um, they worked with DKS, the city's consulting engineer. They started with a scope and then did a traffic analysis letter. I'm gonna briefly summarize those findings. They were included in a memorandum to the planning commission as attachment two. Uh, this is, so we'll start out with chip, trip generation. Um, so this is a multifamily project. We're getting an ADT or average daily trips of 88 trips. On the, you know, grand scheme of things, that's fairly small. Um, sometimes that would be considered somewhat background or percentage buffered increases into a, a tra transportation system plan. I mean, it does, It. I'm not saying that it isn't increasing trips, but um, 88 is not a ton. Um, and then there are uh, the AM peak and PM peak, which AM peak was total six, PM seven. The other important thing to mention about these numbers is that the AM peak and the PM peak, as well as the total trips uh, create thresholds for doing further analysis. So if you're over certain numbers, that would trigger a neighborhood level study or a full blown traffic system plan study or potential mitigation efforts. Um, none of those numbers were triggered by this project. Um, so, However, uh, DKS, at the request of the applicant and also staff, and all, which was largely driven by public comments that were received by staff, looked more into the safety and uh, safety analysis component with pedestrians, vehicles, the uh, view shed area of the access easement, pedestrian interconnectivity, um, the site distance and the distance between intersections. And I'm going to go to the next page here. They, they largely, I mean, although it is close, they found that the intersection locations were not, did not trigger a problem. Um, so that was with Grant Street, which was mentioned in the comments. It is close, but it's not um, out of the city standards. So that, that would not be something that would need to be mitigated, according to DKS. Um, they found that the city's driveway sp spacing and width standards along local streets would be met. Southwest 3rd is a local street. And then um, they did also request some additional work related to pedestrian interconnectivity, which was also mentioned in staff's report. Um, we'd like to see, they would recommended that there be a uh, pedestrian access point a sidewalk or a walkway that connects the subject property to Southwest Third. And then there's also a um, issue with the approach directly into the property. Um, 
and the standard is that it needs to be where the approach meets the access point. It needs to be separated five feet from adjacent driveways. And I'm going to get into a little bit with that um, here in a second with some diagrams that might help that um, be explained a little bit more. The other option is that they, the applicant would request a deviation from that standard which is something that can be granted administratively um, through site plan review or pre-construction. That's the delegated authority from um, city administration to the director as we understand it. But ideally what we would like to see is that the approach is shifted slightly so that there's no deviation required. So here's an image of the proposed access uh, the box, dashed box, is going to be your approach area. The uh, dotted, it's dotted section is the actual paved travel surface. Um, and the, here's the actual code criteria that I've just mentioned um, verbatim, and it speaks to the curb cut location and the five foot separation required between side property lines. Um, deviations can be approved administratively, but again, we would, we would seek to address that outside of the deviation standard. And that would be staff's recommendation to planning commission is that we try to address that during construction phase so that it is not within five feet. And I think that's a doable proposition. So again, um, diving, here's some diagrams. I wanted to dive into the access a bit. Um, if anything's unclear, feel free to ask me, Planning Commission. Uh, so both DKS and staff would like to see pedestrian interconnectivity with subject property and the public interface. We have a 26 foot wide access easement there's a 20 foot paved surface proposed. So that means we have roughly five to six feet of area that could potentially be used for pedestrian interconnectivity. So there's a number of options um, that could work, I believe. Some would be shifts, in this example, we could shift the pavement slightly two feet in one direction and then construct the five foot sidewalk with ADA um, aspects and a rollable curb. The rollable curb allows the fire department to drive their vehicle onto the sidewalk. So it essentially becomes part of the paved surface, except that it does create a, a delineation and demarcation for pedestrian safety. It would be rated for fire trucks. It's pretty, it's not an uncommon technique. Um, and it would kind of be a good marriage between what the fire department is asking and what DKS and staff have asked for pedestrian connection. This, this option would also require that um, the approach be shifted so that they're meeting that five feet of separation from the adjacent property line. This could, this could be another option. Um, you shift in the other direction and then the sidewalk goes on the southern end of the access point with the deviation at the curb cut, which is that blue arrow. And then uh, in this option, all things, we the sidewalk could land wherever, except that the applicant would ask for a deviation from that five foot curb cut standard um, again, that would probably not be the preference of staff, but that's a potential avenue. Uh, the reality is, is this is a tricky project with its access. I mean, there's, there's no way of getting around it, um, but there are options to make this work. Um, and none of these are, you know, drastic feats of engineering. Uh, it will require some consulting and coordination with the applicant's engineer and pub our public works and our city engineer. But I believe that the, one of these options would provide 
safe access for both vehicles and pedestrians to and from the site. Um, oops, let me apologize. So down the street, not very far from here, there was a similar access proposed and built at 161, 169 Southwest Third. It's not very far down the street. Um, this one a little bit different, it has an S curve. You can see that it was actually a little more constrained than the existing property. Almost the exact same conditions, very close proximity to approaches. They were able to build a 20 foot travel surface and a five foot ADA compatible sidewalk. That's exactly what staff would be looking for in this type of project. There's nothing different than that. Um, again, a constrained site, R2 zone property, kind of all the same similar conditions. Um, and it was able to work um, pretty well, I think. Also a rollable curb that allows fire to get in and out. Um, just an example, this is what city standards allow. This is what was constructed down the street. Here's a diagram of that, that image you were just looking at. Pavement section, the uh, ADA sidewalk itself. They had a little bit different constraints with the turning radii and because of this 90 that they had to negotiate. And, and the example with um, your task with reviewing today, planning commission, you're looking at a straight shot. So not the same, same exact same conditions. Um, again, you know, five foot cr concrete sidewalk with rollable curbs, 20 foot wide paved travel surface. So same conditions. So that's the access. Um, I wanted to dive into that the best I could. Um, I do want to summarize again that DKS did not have an issue with the intersections, did not see that this project warranted any further study or analysis. And their main recommendation was that the project included a pedestrian ADA safety accessible location, which is exactly the same as what staff conditioned in the original staff report. There was no other asks that came out of the traffic analysis. Um, I'm gonna push on a little bit, moving um, directions to kind of the, the buildings themselves. And these come from the applicant. These are the elevations they provided. Um, these would be what generally what the structures would look like themselves. They meet the residential design standards. Um, I'm not a architect nor am I a design aficionado. I can't really comment on the aesthetic. One person's aesthetic is different from another's, um, but they do meet our standards. Here's another elevation in a different direction. So uh, pretty, uh, seems fairly typical for a three-story type apartment structure. This is the applicant's la landscape plan. Um, this is required as part of the design review project. So what you're looking at, um, large circles are trees, uh, smaller circles are like bushes and plantings. I think um, at least staff's opinion is that they did are proposing some good buffer in between the R2 and the R1, the R1 area. There's some good landscape planning there. We have a pretty, I would say, robust landscape portion in our design review project. Staff would review all of that through temporary certificate of occupancy and final certificate of occupancy. So we'll we'll make sure the caliper trees and bushes and other plantings that are proposed go where they're supposed to and do create the buffer that they're intended to provide. 
There was one, uh, there was a, con I know this was a public comment and it was also a staff's concern about where in fact the uh, square footage for the recreation area is being proposed. It appears it is generally in this, I guess you would call that Southeast location. Staff did include and will um, emphasize that as a condition of approval, we would definitely want to see that fully delineated and called out in a landscape plan and site plan. We want to know where that location is. So it, if this project were to be approved, it would remain in perpetuity as part of the development. I'm, I'm getting close to the end of my presentation here. Um, so overall, staff reviewed the project and found that it does meet the code as conditioned. Um, there are some conditions that will need to be satisfied. None of them are so drastic that uh, staff believe the project would be in peril of not being able to meet the conditions. One of those was that recreation component. The second is the um, that pedestrian access that we just talked about. Um, that pedestrian access to can be figured out and discussed in detail in the construction part, part of this project um, with the applicants engineer and city staff. Um, I, it's something that we do all the time in subdivision projects. And I think it's something that could easily be resolved in the construction phase of, of this project. Um, there are some uh, additional conditions that are in the staff report. They're about signage, the approach, approach standard and pedestrian interconnectivity. And then lastly, as I, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the presentation is that, so I do as staff recognize that this development is concerning. Um, i saw all your public comments. I read them. I tried to address them as best I can. I provided them to the applicant. Uh, my job is to review those comments, provide feedback to the best of my ability and to review this project based on the criteria. And it is staff's belief that this project meets the R2 zone and the design standards. Um, and I do also recognize that this type of development is a bit different from what's there today. Um, and I just wanted to mention that I'm, I'm aware and cognizant of that. And then lastly, um, again, so my job is to review criteria and to provide recommendations to this body. And the planning commission's job in turn is to take these recommendations, our staff report, additional findings, the public comments that were received and the public comments that we will hear tonight. And then to make a decision whether to approve, to approve condition with conditions or to deny the application. The planning commission can also impose additional conditions mostly related to compatibility or other items that make sense if they would help to alleviate concerns or are related to the project and the criteria. Again, um, here are the criteria that we review these projects on. Um, general provisions, parking, the zone itself, signs, lighting standards, the access, site and design review, and then the general standards, standards and procedures. You, I uh, included all of the public comments that I had received to date in a scanned document and memorandum that was uh, posted to city's website. I uh, did my best to summarize those comments in that memorandum. Um, there were a number of public comments that we received. There was also what appeared to be a signed petition from a number of neighbors and interested parties um, in opposition of this project. 
uh, staff's summarization was that it seemed like the majority of the comments were concerned about the compatibility of a apartment structure going in the neighborhood size, um, the lighting, the appearance, the removal of trees. Um, there was also a number of comments about access and a request for a traffic study, um, which the applicant asked for a continuance for and completed. There was um, some comments related to the height of the structure, um, 35 feet and 35 feet is the standard. Um, they didn't go over 35 feet and they're not requesting a variance. So the staff's opinion that based on the applicant's submittal and the criteria found in the Canby Municipal Code that the project meets the design standards, the setbacks, the parking requirements, the impervious surfacing standards and the parking, uh, excuse me, I already said parking and the access requirements, as well as the residential design standards, which essentially trump 16.49 design review. I've already mentioned that. Um, so to summarize, staff recommend that the planning commission approve DR 21-04 subject to the conditions of approval and to have the applicant adjust the approach so that it's consistent with that code criterion. The approach can be adjusted in the construction plan approval phase or with an administrative deviation. I had already mentioned that a lot of this work can get uh, kind of figured out in greater detail in the pre-construction component. And then these are conditions unique to this approval should the Planning Commission make a motion to approve this project. The applicant shall construct a five foot wide ADA accessible sidewalk or similar pedestrian pathway. The reason I include or similar is from my initial conversation with the applicant and the applicant engineer and the fire department is there's some concern about whether a rollable sidewalk will work. If for some reason a rollable sidewalk won't work, staff will still require that there is some kind of pedestrian delineation within the access area. That's a, um, a requirement. We need to have pedestrian access in some way that's clear that this is for pedestrians and this is for vehicles. Rollable curb out of concrete is going to be the gold standard here, and that's what we would like to see. And that's what staff would recommend the Planning Commission require. And then the second point is that the applicant should clearly designate the location of the recreation area on a copy of the plan, which demonstrates compliance with the minimum square footage required by the code. And I had mentioned that previously. That is it for my presentation, um, commissioners. I am willing and able to answer any questions that you have at this time to the best of my ability. Thanks. Let me make a comment first, Eric. You were, I appreciate the great detail that, uh, that you went into. Uh, it's obvious that you were being uh, very sensitive to the, uh, the the general neighborhood. I appreciate it. Appreciate that, and uh, and so I just uh, a good presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so, any uh, comments by any, any commissioners? Let's start with uh, Mr. Mills, Commissioner Mills. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first off, uh, compliments to to Eric. Great work. Um, very clear, um, difficult project. I, I guess I, uh, I I wanted to. My first question is: um, You've already answered some of the ones I had written to myself in your presentation. Uh, that being, when was this? Uh, when was this area moved to um, from R one to R two? And it sounds like uh, you're saying it was a long time ago which was a key point for me as this has been a point of sensitivity for me 
in the past where we've had projects come through where they were not zoned R2, but they were medium or high density on the comp plan. And this one, I don't have that issue with. I guess, um, are there any other conditions of approval, Eric, other than the ones you've noted? I didn't see any in the staff report, the original staff report or the supplemental staff report, other than the ones that you've summarized in your presentation. Maybe I just didn't find them. There are a number of other conditions of approval um, in the staff report. Um, fortuitously, maybe uh, some of staff's original positions kind of mirrored what DKS is requesting regarding pedestrian access. Okay. Um, there are a number of standard conditions that you'll see with any design review projects, largely related con to construction, also landscaping, parking, drainage. Well, I, I, did, I, I yeah. didn't see the, I did, I'm sorry, I, I didn't see the usual uh, conditions of approval section uh, that is usually handily provided by, by you or other staff uh, that allows us to go through that. And, and I might be missing where that's at. There are a number of documents we're working through here and um, I didn't see that section. So uh, that was a question that I had. If we get to where we're approving on conditions of approval, I haven't seen those. So I'm a little uncomfortable proceeding if I haven't been able to actually see what those conditions of approval are, other than the ones you get in your excellent uh, presentation. Um, yeah. I'm not sure why. I know that I um, included them, but let me. Uh, I I think were they. I think I think I remember seeing uh, a lot of those conditions in the second part of the packet that is referenced from the May 10th meeting. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Okay, but I'm I'm not seeing them. But if you got a page number, let me know. I'd appreciate it. Um, and Mr. Chair, I think I should yield back to the other commissioners. I might have another question or two after the others have had their chance. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mills. Uh, Commissioner Trendy, what are, do you have any questions? Excellent report, Eric. Um, I like that you applied the rules to the project in a way that makes it very understandable, both for the public and the commission. Um, I appreciate that a lot. Um, and... Uh, I don't really have any questions because you answered all of them for me. <laughs> okay. Um, Commissioner Heath. Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. So we'll start with like the, the existing easement. Uh, I walked going by there. Uh, it looks like that existing easement is for underground utilities. Is that correct? Uh, my understanding is that it is a access easement, so that would include any utilities as well. Yeah, well, because uh, it looked like uh, it's going like right through somebody's yard, so they we their yard would have to go away if I'm looking at the maps and everything right. And uh, I think on slide 38, if you could go there. Yeah, so that that uh, red strip, that's where the driveway would be, correct? That's correct. Yeah, so they're, that's right through their yard. Uh, and if I did my math correct, that property line, there's 30, 30 feet from the property line to the edge of the house. Um, uh, what was, uh, it would have been slide 48, I believe, uh, yeah, laid it out a little better. Yeah, so right here where it says, well, below existing dwelling where it says three foot, is that three foot from the edge of the sidewalk to the side of their house? Uh, no, so that three feet is, um, so you, the easement area itself is 26 feet wide. Yeah. So you have three feet on either side which is not paved surface that little dotted section is 20 feet wide is the actual paved surface and that was proposed 
That's including the sidewalk? So there's no sidewalk proposed in this image. Um, not in this image. All so right, I, I'm not sure right. the exact dimension there, but it's more than three feet. All right. So and right below where that uh, three foot mark is, what is that little square? This? No, above that, right there. And what's the I other can speak to that? It's uh, the other existing square? air conditioned units. Yeah, so it's so it's literally uh, that close to somebody's house. That's uh, and there is no road or driveway or anything there yet. Uh, it, it also looks like those driveways, yeah, the neighbor's driveway goes right up to her property line. So there would no be, be no possible way to have a five foot space between the two driveways. It's also the end of the driveway comes right out at the intersection of Grant and uh, and Third Street within 50 feet. If I if right across from where you sit at a stop sign is considered the intersection, which to me it seems like it would. It's uh, yeah, I've, it just I don't see how it's going to fit. Well, there's. Yeah, at, uh, if it's the 26 uh, foot easement, so 20 foot of it would be paved road, or yes. would that be it? So then an additional six feet or five feet for the uh, rollable uh, sidewalk. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're looking at, yeah, four feet from the sidewalk to the side of the house. Is there any sort of uh, required setback for a house from a sidewalk or from a house to a road? Because it seems pretty close. So there's a setback for the curb cut, which this is the property line right here, which is about three feet, which is why I had mentioned earlier that they would need to either move the approach and it's just the approach. It's not the entire length of the access. It's where the curb cut is onto the public street. So there is a distinction there. Um, and so there's that part. I and mean, it is tight. It certainly is tight. Um, my, so Staff relies on our transportation engineers to align with the project is proposed. So for Grant Street, they're looking at center line to center line, and they're talking about dis required distances. And DKS mentions that it's very close, but it meets the spacing standards. All right. Yeah. I, so, I mean, I. I, as the planning staff person, I'm going to rely on our city traffic engineers to review that and give us a good answer. Um, yeah. All right. My my allergies are really picking up a bad time to flare up, but uh, yeah, I I just it just seems odd to me that uh, a house would be able to be like arm's length from uh, the public sidewalk. There's, it would, so that's going to be a private sidewalk. Yeah. And um, for driveways and private infrastructure, especially for driveways, there is no setback from structures. So, again, now granted, this is tight. I, I would agree with you, but um, it's not unheard of and not impossible to accomplish. Um, and again, in this example, we have an almost identical scenario. Um, this is a house right here. Um, it's nearly identical to this scenario. Yeah. So, what, I mean, in terms of it meeting standards, I think it meets standards. Is it tight? Yeah, it's it's tight. What a, what about the uh, you know the decrease in value to that homeowner where that uh, road is going to be paid for? Who would be on the hook for that? Would that be the developer? Would that be the city? Or is that the homeowner that's going to eat that cost? 
but home values are not something that staff review as a criteria. The other thing I will say is that that property, when you buy property and most people, or you should, um, I'm not saying that that's, this is always the case, but you'll get a title report, which is going to show that there's an easement. Um, that easement existed prior to state street coming in to develop the property. All right. Is there, um, is there, is there a difference between underground easements, like, uh, like the telephone lines that are using that easement right now, or, uh, is there, are there, is there a different type for like a, an above ground easement versus an underground easement or is that delineated anywhere? Or? There are a many types of easements, but my understanding of this is a full lawful right to access easement, which would mean okay. you basically property owner X could come through there for any reason to access the property. Uh, yeah, and then one more, I guess. Uh, so you say the property in question is 0.44 acres. Uh, that would be 19,166 square feet. You say the, and then the buildings are going to be another 10,589. Leaves us with like 8,500 square feet after the building. Minus uh, 1,800 feet of recreation area. Uh, that leaves us with 6,700 square feet of of space left, and uh, it looks like the road's going to take up most of that. Is where, what about for impervious area? Uh, how much it needs to be set aside for that? The road's not part of the property because it's an access easement. Yeah, what about so the parking lot? They meet the um, pervious, the impervious and pervious standards. When I initially reviewed this application, they were slightly off and did not meet the pervious and impervious standards. I asked them to correct that. They provided new evidence, um, including the landscape plan, um, in addition to some permeable surfacing in the parking lot itself, which met the 30% minimum requirement from their submittal. All right. So they, so the paving is going to be done with uh, permeable pavement is what you're saying or? Uh, that's, that's what was included in there. So it, not a large portion of it, some of it, but I, um, they did address and correct some deficiencies in their initial submittal when I reviewed this the first time around. Um, based on what I've seen thus far in their app, their sub, their materials is they meet the Im impervious standard. Right. I'll let, I can let the app can address anything about their permeable surfacing and what their plans are, but I, I don't know any specifics on that exact component. All right. right. Um, I'm the civil engineer on the project and I did, uh, we have, uh, slightly revised the site plan um, that pervious is no longer included, but we do provide stormwater treatment and we have met code for pervious and impervious surfaces. So the uh, stormwater will be captured by a series of catch basins and conveyance pipe and then treated and then uh, infiltrated on site. All storm water will remain on site. That answer all your questions, Commissioner Heat. Yes, uh, uh, at this I time. That's it. Yes, sir. Thank you, um, Commissioner Patton. Do you have any questions? First of all, I just want to thank um, staff for putting this together. It was an excellent job. Uh, I also just want to say that I've read through all of the public comments and I uh, appreciate and can understand where the neighbors are coming from with this project. Um, <clears throat> anything that is going into an area like this can definitely cause some consternation. And so I can appreciate where they're coming from. I, I think back to the meeting that we had a few weeks ago where we talked about, um, you know, as a commission, we need to focus on the code and what does and does not work within the code 
and what can reasonably be accommodated within those codes. And, um, you know, after reading through all of this, I think it reasonably fits within the code. Um, one, one thing I will say is, uh, I really wish that we had a more comprehensive way of sort of designing these things to put this apartment building here now is going to fit a need, but I really wish that there was some way that the city could plan these things in for the future so that in five to 10 years, as more of these properties develop into apartments, it all is cohesive. Uh, that is a big problem that I have with these sort of things is that it's not cohesive. It, it is, it will not ultimately be cohesive 10 to 15 years down the road, but that is neither here nor there. Uh, what I do have a question, what I, I completely agree with staff, there must be pedestrian access into this, uh, develop into this development. Uh, that is one thing that is a sticking point for me. Uh, and, and the way I look at the city is that there's too many areas that have been allowed to go in without adequate pedestrian access. And I am, a, I strongly agree with staff that that needs to be part a, a contingent part of this plan. Um, the other thing is, my question is with the um, landscape and the trees that are going in the 15 foot buffer zone, are they being specced in regarding the current standards for trees, both small, medium and large? Is that being taken into consideration or will that be taken into consideration? They have a caliper size requirement going in. Well, um, that's, that's fine. But I mean, as far as the species of trees, because the caliper is one thing, but the ultimate size of that tree is what concerns me. Uh, all too often, trees are specced into these things that fit the need now, but five to 10 years down the road need to be chopped out and then it creates a bigger problem. So I really would hope that the ultimate tree height is taken into consideration when the landscape is considered for this project. Um, another question I have is, is I didn't notice this in the contingencies, but will the developer be working with the uh, the adjacent property owners to have a cohesive fence put in between their properties and this development? I know it was proposed in their plans, and it was also brought up um, from my understanding in the neighborhood meeting that the applicant um, held, and. Um, I'll let them answer specifics, but I think there is a, it appears to be a, like a cohesive kind of fence plan as part of the overall project with the neighboring property owners. It certainly would go a long way to at least attempting to kind of uh, provide some additional buffer between them and the adjoining property. Yes, that is that, I would say that that is a, that is a contingency. And I, I just want to double check with city staff to say, you know, if one of the contingencies to approve this was that the developer must work with the adjacent property owners to install a high quality cohesive fence for all of the adjacent uh, properties, if that is something that we can put in there, yes or no. I'm sorry, Commissioner Pad, I couldn't hear you. I don't know if it's my uh, yeah, computer, yeah. somebody else's oh, or it's yours. Must be my, I'm sorry, every once in a while, my. Uh, it could be the air conditioner, just a second. Uh. <laughs> my mic i had this problem with the with the uh um budget committee so did you did you i i was asking is there a way that we can make am i are we allowed to put in the contingency that the fences have to be cohesive and like a, a high quality cohesive fence be provided between this development and the adjacent properties. Can can we put that in here? Yes or no? Yes. Perfect. Um, and then my last question is, and this isn't necessarily based on this application, but it's for future applications. Is there a way for the city to either on a reg on a semi-regular basis remind residents, you know, that their properties are in a specific zone? or when a property changes ownership, 
that that can be stressed to them because I find that a lot of times people, at least when I bought my house, that was one thing that I investigated was what can be built around me in the future. Uh, is that something that is possible or is that just a ridiculous undertaking? Uh, it's not a, it, I mean, it's not a ridiculous undertaking. I mean, there a limited amount of R2 property in the city. It's something um, that is coming down the pipeline in terms of um, some house bills that are happening. I don't think it's a huge ask and it's something that we could at least try to attempt to provide more information on our, on our new city website and any way that we can inform the public, I think is, is better than not. I, I think if we could do that for future developments like this, because unfortunately, you know, a lot of times the, the people who have either owned these houses for a long time or have purchased them and did not necessarily pay attention to the zoning that they're going into or the zoning that they butt up against. Um, I think it would be good for the city to kind of look at doing those sort of things. So that way we can maybe mitigate some of these questions uh, in advance of these sort of projects. So, it, so that the, uh, you know, the residents of these adjacent properties don't feel like, you know, we're trying, the city is trying to slip something in, uh, you know, behind their back or without them knowing. Uh, I, I'm a huge advocate in, in, you know, education, you know, educating people so that they're not caught unawares. And I think that would be a, a good lesson that we can learn from this one. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Patton, just to add to that, um, there will be outreach uh, occurring as part of the housing needs analysis work that will be probably starting this fall or winter. Um, and that's the hope anyway, to um, move that forward. We're, we're probably going to be getting uh, a grant for that work. And um, so there will be outreach accordingly. Uh, we would like to echo your comments. Uh, I think there's perhaps not a complete understanding by folks as to where each property is zoned in the city and what that means. Excellent. And then the last thing I just, I couldn't quite read my scribble here. Uh, I did just want to say that I also agree that that, um, that the recreation area needs to be delineated in the final plan. I, I agree that that is important as well. And I think that was it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Patton. Uh, we'll move along to uh, Commissioner Boatwright. Yeah. Um, I, this is Commissioner Boatwright. I have a couple of quick questions so we could try and get them out of the way in a hurry so we could get to the applicant. Uh, Eric, you're talking about the apartment buildings to the, to the east, the driveway that goes in there are, are pretty much the same. Well, it's not quite true because those apartment buildings do not have a driveway that runs right along the property line like, like this proposed development has. Um, the traffic report is wrong. There is not, unless there is gonna be an S-shaped entrance, entrance into this thing at the very street, at the street, there's not 10, 10 feet between, there won't be 10 feet between driveways. Doesn't look like there will be anything between those driveways. They'll be right right next to each other because they'll both be right on the property line. That is a heat pump next to the house that that driveway is right up next to. And I don't see how you're gonna get even five feet on the west side of that house with that heat pump there. Uh, another question I have, uh, you might answer this before the applicant uh, talks, is the designated play area, from what I understand in the code, can't be in the setback area between the R1 zone and the R2 zone. So those are the only two things I wanted to bring up. Now you can go ahead to the applicant and let him answer those questions or whatever you want, but that's all I have to say. Yeah, let's uh, let's give Commissioner Trendy an opportunity to uh, to step in here. Um, 
Commissioner Trendy, what are your thoughts? Do you have any questions for staff? Um, no, I don't have any questions for staff. Um, I have noticed that the, the some of my fellow commissioners definitely have done their homework tonight. Um, Thing that I didn't even find in the reports. So, um, wow. Anyway, um, I just uh, think that Eric did a good job of presenting it. I understand where they're trying to um, make the conditions to have it meet uh, the requirements and move forward. And the um, as long as it meets the code, unfortunately, by state law, we pretty much need to do what we need to do. Um, I will say that I live near a three-story uh, community, and it's really not that invasive. So um, anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Commissioner Trendy. Did I miss anybody? Um, Commissioner Mills, did you have a follow-up question that you had deferred from your original uh, statement uh, for staff? Uh other than uh, where the conditions of approval are that are available for our review, uh, no. Uh, I've got some other things I might want to say, but I think I'll wait till after we hear from the applicant. Okay. Uh, then at this time, I will we will move along to the applicant. Uh, so let me just um, once more go over this. The applicant will have uh, not more than 15 minutes. Uh, other proponents, not more than five minutes. Opponents, or excuse me, uh, proponents, not more than three minutes. Opponents, not more than three minutes. And then rebuttal by the applicant, not more than 10 minutes. So we'll hear from the applicant. If you could, who's who's speaking for the, uh, who is the applicant here? Who's speaking I'll, for? I'll speak to represent the applicant. Could, okay, could you state your name and address, please? My name is Mark Wildey. I'm a principal at State Street Homes. Our address, our office address is 1233 Northwest Northrop, Suite 125, Portland, Oregon, 97209. Okay, proceed. Uh, first off, I wanted to thank Eric. I think he did a fantastic job presenting this project. Uh, tell that he did a lot of uh, work preparing this presentation, and I was very pleased with it. Um, I have a few things that I'll add to it, but I think Overall, he covered all of the details of the project itself. So wanted to also quickly thank uh, the commissioners for listening to this project. Um, I think I wanted to state that we worked really hard uh, in planning this project to make sure that we met the, co the cohesive plan for City of Canby's planning. Um, as Eric mentioned, this is a code or this zoning code has been in place here for quite a long time, and so we've identified this project um, as one that I think would work really well. As a company, we work in emerging markets. So we look for cities that we can um, bring responsibly planned projects to that are growing. And we identified the city of Canby as one of those. Um, did a little research and noticed that the census study that was done with Metro showed approximately 15% expected growth in the next five years for the city of Canby from 21,688 to 25,352. The other piece of data that was extremely important to us was that you guys have a vacancy rate of under 1% for rental homes, which generally in our market uh, is means that there's a shortage of rental housing. Um, and so that's why we identified both the city of Canby and this particular piece of property. The zoning also lent to the kinds of projects that we do. We worked really hard with our designers and our engineers to come up with something that was attractive, uh, that, was, that met the standards. We generally like to propose projects that don't require adjustments to the code uh, or variances. And so we worked really hard with inside the code, uh, the zoning code for Canby to make sure that this project from the beginning met that, those standards. And it sounds like Eric agrees and the staff agrees that we did that. Um, wanted to talk about that pedestrian access that Eric mentioned. And I think that we agree that that's a, and we also agree with DKS that that, that would be a, a positive addition to this. And so we're very interested in seeing how staff and the fire bureau can work together to help us come up with something that meets the standards from both bureaus um, and that is uh, economically feasible. And I think some of the options that we talked about tonight, we would support. 
we've heard a lot about concern with privacy um, from the neighbors. And as you guys saw on our site plan, we proposed quite a bit of things to help mitigate some of that impact. One of them I heard uh, one of the commissioners, I can't remember who it was, talk about fencing. And yes, we're proposing a fence all the way around the property to provide privacy for both our tenants as well as the neighbors. And then you can also see in that landscape plan that Eric showed, we have extensive plantings, pretty much a solid barrier of plantings with trees and uh, kind of full growth tall plants to also lend to some more privacy and buffer, especially with sound, um, but also visual and solar privacy. Um, let's see, what else did I want to mention? We, we worked hard to make sure that we uh, met the standard of that buffer between the two zonings. And I think that's important. Uh, we agree that that's important because when you're transitioning from a higher density type zoning to a lower density, it's, it's really important that we provide some space there. Um, and so we met that 15% buffer, as you can see in our site plan. Uh, also, there was quite a bit of talk tonight about the outdoor recreation area. And we did, uh, we did design a project that met those standards. That area is going to be, is consisting of the kind of outdoor area that would be next to our proposed uh, stormwater management area. And then also we're including the balconies and porches as part of that outdoor area. Most jurisdictions allow us to include the porches and balconies to meet that criteria. And so we did meet that, um, at least based on our calculations. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to offer? Um, oh, the, we, there, was some, there was some conversation about the easement tonight. Uh, I wanted to state that the easement's already in place. It's an access easement. We're not proposing to add that easement or access. That exists. That existed when we bought this property. And so we're not proposing any particular changes to that. The access easement exists there now, and it's available for any future development, whether it be ours or somebody else's in that property. Uh, with that, I'm open to any questions um, the commissioners might have, or we can hear from some of the neighbors if that's where we're at. Well, we're not there yet, but uh, the, the uh, other commissioners might have some uh, questions for you. Let's start with, uh, again, with Commissioner Mills. Yeah, I, I did have a question. I, I, I appreciate the extensive effort made to uh, buffer the, uh, what I think is the southern edge of the property that, that abuts R1. My question to you is uh, what, it appears that other than trees and the promised fence that the only buffering that's really available to the uh, houses uh, on what I think is the east side, which are in R2, is I'm going to say nothing. Uh, I got to ask you what is what is the uh, uh, we've used the term compatibility. I'm not sure what that means other than compatibility with a neighborhood. The neighborhood is was built as R1. It's now R2. I think that's what we're going to hear from a lot of the public comments and. Um, it, what are you doing to alleviate the concerns about compatibility with the single family residents that are currently zoned R2? Well, well I'll speak to the buffer part first. So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go back to what I'd mentioned is the, we're kind of providing two layers of buffer or privacy there. One being the wood fence, uh, but also then those plantings. And the plantings, I believe, actually provide quite a bit more both sound and visual privacy, even even more than the fence, especially as they mature and grow. Uh, I think it, I'm not sh quite sure how to respond to the question about compatibility. Any any emerging community that has an existing high density zoning in place, it generally there is a transition period as those communities grow and develop. Uh, and and I wanted to say that we recognize uh, we're not we're not numb or immune to, to the impact these have on the neighbors. We, we actually spend a lot of time listening to the neighbors. That's actually why we asked for a continuance on this, this hearing was after some of those comments, we decided we actually did want to go back and get uh, that traffic study from DKS and, and consider some more plantings and some other fencing things. And so it's, it's always a very hard balance as a developer, especially as we come into growing communities that, that haven't quite infilled all of this high density zoning. But again, we work really hard to provide as much privacy as we can and also to 
to, to develop and build and propose attractive buildings. And, and you guys, again, design is, is um, not the same for everybody and it doesn't appeal to everybody, but we, we're pretty proud of this design. And I think it, it integrates well into this community and, and probably a lot more of the growth that the city of Canby will see in the next decade. Any, any further, <coughs> excuse me, uh, any uh, further question for the applicant, uh, Commissioner Mills? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I don't have any further questions. Okay. But uh, Commissioner Patton, do you have any questions for the applicant? Uh, I don't, other than to say that I uh, uh, I did just kind of, I'm sorry I missed it, I looked through the plant, the planting diagram, and I did notice that all of the trees that you have specced in for the 15-foot buffer zone are all deciduous, and so I don't know if any concessions can be made for uh, winter when all those trees are defoliated, just something to think about. <clears throat> that, is that it? Okay. Yes. Uh, com com thank you. Uh, Commissioner Trendy, do you have any questions for the applicant? No, I don't have any questions for the applicant. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Heed, do you have any questions for the applicant? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, uh, I guess. Oh, so is there or is there not a requirement for 10 feet between driveways? It was a. Uh, yeah. I don't know that could be for you or Eric. So I'll go ahead and let Eric answer that question. I'm not, I'm not specifically well versed in the, all the transportation code. All, um, all I'm aware of is that we met all of the standards um, for spacing between driveways. Yeah. Well, Eric. All right. well because uh, there's a, there's a statement uh, in the, in the supplemental memorandum that uh, was submitted by uh, Jennifer Driscoll and just that there's a Google Earth map right here, and I don't know how well everybody else can see it there, but here's an existing driveway, and this is where the proposed driveway is going to grow. Go, and then I just don't see how there's going to be any sort of leeway as far as spacing there for it would be what 20 feet of road, six foot of sidewalk, and 10 foot between between driveways comes to 36 feet, but there's only 30 feet between the property line and the house. I just don't see how it's gonna fit if that 10 foot between driveways is a requirement. Can you help out with that, Eric? Yeah, so two things. Um, one again is that five foot curb cut separation, which is the approach, um, <clears throat> which creates that separation between two access points. DKS did make a finding towards that, which would require moving the approach slightly from five feet curb cut distance away from the adjoining driveway. And then the driveways themselves and the property lines, the driveway can be up to the property line. Yeah, um, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. It might help if you pulled up that slide, if that's at all possible in the memorandum. Uh, it's uh, Jennifer Driscoll's yeah, testimony. She... Uh, she included some some photos of the approach and uh they'd run the two driveways would run exactly parallel to each other and there would be no space left to have any sort of space between their driveways I just don't, uh, don't see any way to uh get around that unless you do plan on making some sort of snaked driveway or if it curved somehow I'm just not picturing that, especially with, uh, I believe it was slide 48 that you had earlier. It, it shows a straight driveway and the straight driveways would run parallel to each other within riding adjacent to each other. Yeah, yeah so, so 
um, again, this this is the approach area. Yes, there's there's another driveway on the on the right. west side of that dash line, though. Yep. And, um, so the driveway is proposed to be. It looks like in this, I would say, call that three feet. And that's why I had mentioned we'd like to see the approach move two additional feet. So there's that five foot separation at the curb cut, which I guess would be a very minimal type of an S situation, but it could then straighten out as the private access way and be within um, very close proximity to the property line. That's also what I'm hearing from DKS. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. I just feel really bad for that uh, homeowner right there. And <laughs> it's like, yeah, that between that and the, the neighbors there, it's, uh, it's going to be pretty crammed. But yeah, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Boatwright. Do you have some questions yeah, for I I have a question for Eric real fast. Is that five foot separation code for uh, a high residential, high density? Or do we have to do a variance for that? No, there's no variance needed. They'd either, they just need to move the approach so they can show that there's the five foot curb cut. The other alternative is there's a deviation which is allowed through an administrative procedure that could be done. And again, our staff's position is that that's not really necessary and they could move and accommodate that five feet where the curb cut is. Would Built they have, would they have to get uh, permission from their neighbor for that easement now? Because wouldn't that shift the easement a little bit? Not as long as they're in the 26 foot width of the easement. That's, oh, okay. that's, I mean, that easement is their, their lawful right to do whatever kind of improvements are necessary to, to provide lawful access to the property. Okay. Now, yeah. uh, according to this, what I'm looking at on your screen, it shows space between the property line all the way back along their driveway but I didn't see where that could, there would be room for that when I was there today. That dotted line and then their driveway. Right. Is the dotted line the actual driveway that exists to the west, the property line? That dotted line is a property line. And how, uh -huh. much, how much space is between that dotted line and the driveway? Is that three feet? Three feet. Oh, okay. So your actually driveway will not be right on the property line of the neighbor. Nope. Okay. I mean, what you see on the ground is going to be hard to visualize on plan view. Yeah. Well, there's uh, two or three big trees right on that property line. So there are. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said in the beginning of the presentation, I, I do fully recognize this is a tight, tight site, um, and access is crucial to the project, but I, I think it's doable. I think they can meet the curb cut standard, and I think DKS looked at the project thoroughly through an engineer's lens. Um, I'm, I'm not in the position to counter their their professional opinion on it, so... Well, they said 10 feet, and I know there's not 10 feet. I'm no traffic guy, but I'm a tool and die maker, and I can measure feet. So <laughs> um, if, they, I don't, if they can shift that entryway, I guess, and give you the five-foot separation at the curb, uh, I don't guess I don't have a problem with it other than that because then we wouldn't have to change the code or give them a variance. Okay, that, that's all I have. Thank you. And I'll, and I'll mention as the applicant, we support that, uh, that change. So I think 
we support the idea of, of shifting that over and, and meeting that standard for the five foot. Okay, thank you very much. I think, did I miss anybody? Um, any commissioners have any further questions? Okay. Um, we'll move along to any other proponents, people in favor of this project that would like to speak at this time. Okay, uh, then we'll move along to people that are opposed to this project. Um, Eric, uh, do we have uh, some people that would like to speak in opposition? Uh, I, yes, I believe there are at least there are several people here that would like to speak. Um, my request would be that the person that speaks identifies themselves with their name and address so that I can have mm -hmm. that for the record. Right. That, that, that is part of what we need to do. So uh, who do we have up first? Looks like Rhonda would like to speak. Okay, Rhonda, uh, please state your name and address. We have Rhonda is either muted or hey, Rhonda, you're you're muted, Rhonda. You need to unmute. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. we can. I'm sorry about hey, that. So Rhonda, um, if, if you could state your name and address to begin, and then you have three minutes. Uh, my name is Rhonda Schechtman. I live at 431 Southwest Third Avenue. And okay. um I am the person who wrote about the um historic preservation plan that the city of Canby spent a lot of money having um, a, a, a lot of research done on how we can improve Canby. It's part of Canby's economic development plan. And my understanding of reading this document is that the purpose of it is to help the city employees and the city council to guide their decisions as they um, make these specific type of decisions. This area is a historic area. There is a whole list of, of properties that I included that are of historic value. And I think many of them were missed, including that house that's sitting right in front of where they're gonna develop was not on the list, but is obviously should be. There was a comment in the, in the plan about how a lot of those prop, uh, things were taken from little pieces of note paper. And I think that some stuff was missed um, and I, I understand that this area has been zoned R2 since 1980, but the purpose of this plan was to say, we need to make a change in order to protect the value of Canby, which is partly in its historic properties. And there's a lot of room that you guys have leeway. Yes, there's, there's a difference between doing what is doable and what is actually right. And if you come down and I really, and grateful for the counselors who came and looked at the property. That um, driveway that is right next to, that they keep saying, oh, it's gonna be just like this driveway. Well, that driveway is really ugly and it's a lot of concrete. And I don't want to see that spread down the street towards my house. And there's so many other things that could be done to mitigate that. The, the, the height of the building could be brought down to only two stories. It doesn't have to be as dense as what State Street is proposing. It could be six um, thing, six units instead of 12 units. There are a lot of things that could be done that would still fit into the R2 requirements and could also protect the historic value of our neighborhood. And I can say that I know they've done a traffic study, but we're in the middle of COVID. I don't know how valid that could be. Across the street from where I live, they built only six units. And since they've built those six units, my street is covered in cars every single night, despite the fact that each house has an, a garage and a driveway. The impact of this is going to be a lot more than I think people um, that the, the facts on paper look like. If you come and look at the street, it will be huge. That's all I have to say. Uh, my husband would also like to speak. Is that possible? Is he, he, he can have, he's not on his own device. Okay. Um, state your name and address. 
and you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Sheckman. I live at 431 Southwest uh, 3rd Avenue here in Canby. Um, I, I just want to talk in a bigger picture. I just find it uh, really disconcerting that the default position we find ourselves in here is that it's very clearly um, a bunch of concerned neighbors, the people, the electorate, uh, pitted squarely against their, you know, people they supposedly elected to represent them and the powerful interests. And uh, that, you know, I mean, despite the historical uh, background with the uh, density designations and whatnot, um, I think it's, you know, in a, from a very common sense perspective, uh, three-story building clearly does not fit into this neighborhood. And um, the idea that it's not gonna be uh, you know, substantially impactful for those people who bought a single family dwelling and, and wanna go into the backyard and have a little bit of privacy uh, facing with a bunch of windows uh, from somebody's bedroom, um, staring down over them, it, it, it's just ridiculous. Um, this should never have been approved. And um, you know, I sense that the uh, the opposition here, I mean, is, is gonna be, uh, pretty solid. Uh, I've heard people talk about hiring uh, legal representation to fight, you know, here again, the uh, people that we supposedly are, have elected to represent us. And it's very clear to me that it's not a uh, equitable situation where we have kind of one seat at the table here and the powerful development interests have an equal vote and this kind of thing. I'm hearing uh, statements from people, well, we have no choice. This uh, growth uh, from, you know, the people at Metro and whatnot uh, have commanded us to do so. And, you have no say in uh, your own neighborhood. And um, I, I disagree. I think, you know, it's going to take a, uh, a concerted effort by people to take back their government. But um, yeah, it's, it, 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 I, I'm, it's very sad. And uh, that's what, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Uh, Eric, who is next? Uh, I'm not sure. There we have a, uh, looks like Jonathan Claiborne. Okay, yeah. so Jonathan Claiborne, um, your turn. Thank you. Um, okay, if, you name, state, if you could say your name and address, you have three minutes. Yes, my name is Jonathan Claiborne. I am the homeowner at 285 Southwest 3rd Avenue, which is the property that uh, We'll have this easement going through it and also in front of the uh, proposed apartment buildings. Uh, I am opposed to this construction project. Um, it, it, it's very invasive. Uh, as some of the commissioners pointed out, it is a very tight area. Uh, what is proposed here will put this driveway right up against my house within four or five feet of my house right up against my AC units um, and right alongside uh, the other the other driveway of my neighbor. I understand that the easement access can be moved to accommodate this uh, buffer space that must be there, but that eliminates the, the fact that it will swerve back and those driveways will run parallel right next to each other the rest of the way once you get away from the access point. Um, if you put this five foot sidewalk in, which is, seems to be a mandatory thing, um, there, there will be no buffer space between the sidewalk and, and the other, whichever, whichever side they decide to put it on, it will be right up against one of these properties. Um, I, I have my master bedroom on the side of the house. So when this goes in. Um, I will be looking straight at this face to face. It won't be attractive to me. Yeah, uh, I bought this home because of its historical value, because of its uh, aesthetic. And the proposed apartments do not vibe with this neighborhood. They are completely modern. Uh, there's no historical attribute to them at all. Um, on top of that, there are several trees that will be removed. Um, there, are, there are seven in just the front yard. There are 19 trees along the side separating the properties. And then there are seven to eight very large trees in the back property that will be removed in order for this project to go on. Um, 
that's concerning. Um, the, the fence right up against my window, I, I just can't, I can't, I can't see that uh, being, being something that would be acceptable. Um, the, um, it, it, it does say in that in State Street's proposal that this is an existing easement. I, I understand that uh, that must mean that it, it's an, a, an easement access. There's something that could, could possibly be uh, a paved access. There is no existing access. There will be a lot. I mean, there, there will be a have to be much construction done in order for this to go in, which will be, uh, you know, very noisy, very time consuming. I don't know how long this project is supposed to take to complete but it would be very hurtful for the, for the community. Um, I know I'm running out of time, but the, 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 uh, 50, the 50 feet, I think is the code for between center lines of this, of the street on grant. And then the center line of this there, there's not 50 feet there, not even a chance of that. Um, so that, that definitely doesn't meet that requirement. Uh, so if we could kind of wrap up your portion of it so other people can speak. Sure. Um, so, so, so basically I'm with, I'm with, I think the commissioners who brought up the, the arguments against this happening, I, I would hope that the rest of the commissioners and the, the people who can make this decision will uh, side with the community on this issue that uh, we turn down the state street project um, it's just too massive. It, it, it's too overbearing. And uh, thank you. That's all I had to say. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Uh, Eric, who is next? Looks like Jenny Driscoll. Um, do we have Jenny Driscoll? Can I share my screen? Uh, can you do what? May I share my screen? Uh, if you can do it within three minutes, that's that'll okay. be fine. All so right. set your name and address. And Hi, my name is Jennifer Driscoll. I live at 249 Southwest 3rd Avenue. It's the house next on the other side of the yellow house, further down 3rd and closer to Ivy. Um, something that there was some confusion from the commissioners about who didn't have a chance to look at this super in detail. Um, the original easement was for 20 feet. It was changed um, in the later stages of the planning to 26 feet. There's four feet of difference between Jonathan's house and the, lot, the line. His air conditioning unit will be right up against the six foot fence that is required as a condition of approval. approval. Um, and that is it's right up at his air conditioning unit, which the ASHRAE standard is you need two feet of distance around an air conditioning unit so it doesn't burn up and die. Um, it'll run inefficiently and then it'll eventually just poop out because there isn't proper ventilation if you've got a wall against one side of it. So his, air con his heating and air conditioning is at risk just based on proximity. If they can practically reach out their window and touch this fence, the whole left side of their house, this gorgeous historic house is going to have this fence right there. Um, and the other side of the easement is our neighbor, um, the Fifield house at 299. This is the image that um, uh, Commissioner he, um, uh, James, I think, uh, was trying to show you. So this is the existing driveway at 299. And this is the easement. It would take out this tree here and everything over to here. All of this gets opened up to be able to create access for the easements to go to the lot behind 285. This is the Google Street View. If you're coming down third towards Grant, you can see the existing driveway here. You can see the 26 feet that would need to get opened up. Yeah, and sorry to interrupt you. I'm not seeing the screen. And neither am I. Gosh darn it, really? No. It says that I'm screen sharing. Do I need permission? Yeah, right. I think that. Eric, are the people on your guys' end? Yeah, whoever's. Um, whoever's host would have to grant permission. And that's not me. <laughs> um, anybody who actually has on their computer access to the uh, supplemental PDF that was issued last week, it's going to be on page 26.
I, I'm not seeing it. Okay. So, I mean, if you can't bring it up on your own. So, basically, I really sincerely wish that the um, the host would be able to grant me access to truly share it. Um, but if you look at it, it is a picture of a big, lush green yard with 100-foot-plus trees lining it um, that's going to have this gaping uh, <laughs> um space just right next to it. it. It is immediately against the existing driveway. It is less than 10 feet from the drive, the center of the 26 foot easement to the rest of it. I mean, if you guys aren't able to see it, I'll stop sharing and I'll just flip around between this actual, um, the actual um, rules that you guys want to have referred to. But Sorry, that really lost my train of thought. But basically what it comes down to is the traffic assessment is incorrect. Um, it says that there's at least 10 feet of distance between the next closest driveway, and that's not true. They abut one another. Um, it is very close to the intersection, which they also did call out. Um, all of the houses on the south end of 3rd between Ivy and Fir um, meet the criteria for the historical, um, docu the historical um, consideration. Um, if we need to get just technical and stuff, um, the uh, porches and balconies, according to the rules, and I can't tell you without looking it up, but it's in some of my previous notes, there's a code that says the porches and balconies do not count towards the recreational area, um, and the area by the stormwater um, that State Street just mentioned is where they wanted to poke the rec area. That's within the 15-foot buffer that meets up with the, uh, the R1 uh, abutment yeah. in the back. I, I hate to hate to interrupt your your testimony but your three minutes are up i hate to and there are other people apparently that want to get on and um and and speak on your side of it so uh maybe you can work with somebody and i'm not the guy uh, on getting um permission to have a shared screen that would that would be very helpful i don't know how to do that yeah i did it on my end and it said i was sharing the screen but i'm pretty sure permissions prevented it from showing to you guys but if you look through the supplemental packet that was posted by the commission you'll be able to see the pictures starting with page 26 of that pdf you can see what i was talking about to get the visuals but um there are actually quite a few rules that have already been previously submitted in terms of distance um in terms of um location there are a lot of things that are not being met by what has been proposed okay. in the proposal itself That's okay well well thank you, well, thank, you. Yeah. thank you for saying your piece so eric uh who would be next um there's a number of people who have not spoken um that would like to yeah, I'm not sure they, if they, at this point it would be probably just unmute yourself and identify yourself and speak. Okay, so. Uh, uh, I, can, I can speak. Um, okay. Uh, name and address. Uh, my name is uh, Maria Navidad Valadez. I live at 407 South Holly Street. Okay. So. Uh, you have you got your three minutes. Thank you very much. So I, I live south of the proposed property. And so my concerns were around minimum density. And so we're looking at uh, 4.4, 4, sorry, 0.44 of an acre, which is not one acre. And so um, the number of apartments proposed does not follow the recommendation of Studio 3 architect site plan. And uh, it states in the minimum residential density for one acre is 14. The minimum residential density is five units for 0.35 acres. So I'm wondering why we're, you're proposing 12 apartments in a 0.44 square acre. So that's uh, a question that I have and a concern. And I've lived at this property for over 20 years, never thought that I'd be having these type of um, concerns. So. I appreciate the commissioners and um, somebody else who brought that that was an issue because I think it needs to be addressed at a higher level. Um, and also the compatibility, you know, there, there's common consensus that it is not, you know, aesthetically 
appropriate for this neighborhood with all of the uh, R1, which, you know, I live in an R1 area. And in terms of the traffic study, which is something that I had requested um, to have professional considerations, um, it really is, you know, during this um, COVID period where traffic is not as high as on average. And so I don't really see how that um, study is um, going to support, especially when there's gonna be growth uh, once that apartment comes into play. Um, and, you know, the transportation concerns that are identified publicly in the uh, Canby Transportation System 20 year plan, where it says that the project 16, 17 and 18 are intended to divert traffic from Southwest Third Avenue. So if we identify, if you've identified as a city that there is a concern, why are we adding, there was already uh, an existing apartment complex built at 203 Southwest Third Avenue about a year ago. So why are we adding 12 more units to an area that already has concerns? Um, and lastly, um, you know, in terms of the, um, so, you know, I just see that the city's um, responsibility is to assess whether there is um, traffic congestion, housing, betterment of housing, um, you know, and adhering to the regulations and policies that are in place. And I feel that uh, there's a lot of bending of the rules. There's a lot of um, just accommodations for um, the builder. And so, you know, what is the interest of, I mean, why are we having this um, public hearing when, and, uh, when there has already been a proposed approval? When there's conditions that are um, supposed to, uh, in my opinion, should have been met. And I know that um, one of the commissioners, Mills, brought up that the conditions were not really identified. Um, so I just see that there's a lot of different concerns. And my property, I'm going to have to move my pond to the other side of the property, um, you know, because of the privacy concerns. I hate to interrupt you, Maria. Thank you for your testimony. But there are a lot of people who want to talk this evening, so you know. Uh, I, thank you. Yeah, so, I appreciate all of the um, work that has been um, really done by the commissioners to really look at this um, in the best interest. And I know that you know um, in the best interest of Canby, but also uh, following the rules. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Maria. Uh, uh, Chair. Chair Savoy yes. and Eric, if and I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but I see this being a, a little chaotic. I've written down the names of the folks that are that are posted on here. Would you mind if we just kind of go down through this list and, and tick the folks off so that way we can keep track of it? Uh, if you uh, if you want, I don't know how you want to do that, but go ahead. I I, I have not been writing down the names. So I, I I have next year on the list uh, Patsy. I saw Patsy was up there. Just she, yes, she, okay. Okay, I can't hear John. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, okay, Patsy, uh, state your name and address, and uh, you've got your three minutes. Thank you. My name is Patsy Byfield. I live at 299 Southwest 3rd Avenue. I am the direct neighbor on the west side of the proposed um, uh, project that we're talking about tonight. Um, my concerns are mostly, um, I think, the driveway. Um, as uh, Commissioner he mentioned, there is no space between my driveway and where this proposed driveway is going to be. There's there's no separation. My property line is the edge of my driveway and the edge of where they're going to be, where those giant trees are as well. Um, those trees will have to be removed from what I understand. And my question, and I asked the builder um, in a previous meeting, how do you propose on getting all that those trees down without encroaching on my property? I mean, my driveway is fairly narrow anyway. 
And so my husband and I and, and uh, my son drive in and out, you know, multiple times a day. Coming in there to remove those trees is not going to be an easy task. And it's not something they're going to get done in an hour. How am I going to get in and out of my property while you're doing that? Um, and then the fencing um, that they're proposing. My front door faces um, the yellow house. It's it's not my my front door doesn't face the street. It faces to the east. And so they're going to put this fence up um, basically nine feet from my front door. And I'm going to open my front door and here's going to be a six or eight foot fence. I mean, I'm not looking forward to that view out my door. I mean, right now I see greenery and trees and whatnot. And, you know, this comes to fruition. I'm going to be looking at a, a blank wall, a fence. Um, I just, um, I'm concerned about uh, so many things, the construction, the noise, the disruption of our lives through this whole process, not to mention when the apartment buildings do go in in the back, um, the added traffic and the foot traffic and the children. I mean, think about the children that are going to live there and have to walk down that road to go to school. I mean, it's just ludicrous to me that the commission would even um, consider approving this proposal. So, I mean, that's my two cents. Patsy, thank you very much. Appreciate your, your taking your time and an effort to testify. Eric, uh, who do we have next on our list? So I would, uh, I have next Karen. Oh, you have a list. I didn't get a list. Well, I've created a list. Oh, okay. Yes, so uh, I have Karen Bourbon, but then it's dot, 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 so there might be more after that. <laughs> it's Karen Bourbonnet. I live Bourbon. at 289 South Grant Street. Okay, Karen, uh, thank am, you very much. You have yeah. three minutes. I was, I am catty corner from this development. Yeah. I am at the corner of Third and Grant. I, my concern is I've already gone to the Canby Safety Committee regarding the parking on Grant Street and 3rd. Because Enterprise Rental Cars seems to think that's a big old parking lot for them. They don't need a, they don't need a um, parking lot. They can just park all over. I don't know what's happening with that right now. I've gone to several meetings. I have not gotten any word back on what the consensus is of that. There's been some traffic studies. The traffic study that was done by this project has me going big time because traffic there, I can sit, I work at home. I work, I telework. At eight o'clock in the morning, it is a zoo. At five o'clock at night, it is a zoo on that road. Coming down, Grant, stopping, turning right or left on third. Third Street is a racetrack, especially when school gets out. You are going to put another driveway in there, dumping traffic out onto that street. And it's not lined up with, with uh, Grant. So there's a little bit of a, you, you pull out or you don't pull out. It's going to be a traffic nightmare. I'm just telling you right now. Um, pedestrians, kids walking, that's what the, they walk to school down that road. I am very concerned about the traffic issue that you're causing. And I've already gone to the traffic, the safety traffic committee and talked about that to two of those meetings. So Eric was in those meetings as well. I am livid to think that you are going to dump 24 more, potential 24 more cars parked back there, 12 units times two cars. Because you know what? Most people only have two cars, hopefully. In parked in 6,000 square feet back there with a fire truck that can go back there and try and turn around in that parking lot with that. I'm sorry. I am livid. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I, I know we need, I know we need people, places for people to live. This is not a good, this is not a good situation. I know my time's not up yet, but um, I just think that the, that the traffic, the safety traffic in Canby should really look at this whole situation a whole lot more right now and look at that and do your traffic study, not at 6 a.m. and 7 p.m., do your traffic study at 
5 p.m. in the evening. Do your traffic study when school is on in session, the high school and the kids going to school, the kids walking down that street. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you, Karen. Um, so Jason, you have the list. Who, who do we have next? So according to this uh, little box, it says uh, Costa Facilis. Costa's with the applicant team. Okay, there we go. Uh, Nathan Wolseley. Don't know, Nathan. Oh, must be Nathan dropped off. Okay. Um, there's someone labeled Chris. And that is all the name is, it's just Chris. Okay. We have Chris out there somewhere in the ether. Who do you have next, uh, Jason? Uh, and the, he may have already been uh, Sigler. Was he was the first one, or he he is the Yellow House, correct? I believe so. I believe he's a real estate agent. Oh, Can okay. I don't know if he's a proponent or an opponent. So this is this is one of the things that we mentioned in our work session is that people need to be given advance notice that they have got to update their names in their screen with what their position is because this is why these meetings take so long. Uh, Sandra Sammons. Sandra is an opponent. So Sandra, this is her time to speak. Hi, I'm Sandra Salmonson and I live at 399 South Holly. Well, My biggest thank part you for coming forward and yeah, three minutes. Okay, my concern is how tall the buildings are, the privacy. He's going to put in a wood fence. It's going to fall down in a couple of years. It's just the whole thing does not fit in this neighborhood. It will. I've lived in my house forty years, and this will look directly into my living room, my kitchen, my dining room. There will be absolutely no privacy in my backyard because I'm towards the back of it, but I'm on by building B where they're going to have that little sewer drain off thing too. I, I am, I am strictly opposed to this. I think it's ridiculous that it's even being considered. It's just way too big of a building for what is going, what is back there on 0.44 of an acre. And Third Street is a nightmare to drive down. It's basically a one-way street. I don't know who this traffic survey is ridiculous. I don't think they addressed everything. And I am opposed to this all the way. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Sandra, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, Jason, who do we have next? Okay, so there was a Katie, but it looks like they've dropped off. Now, this one I'm going to really butcher, but it shows on the screen as uh, Belling, Bellahoon ACL. There were two individuals. It looked like they were sitting in a living room at a couch. Looks like Billy Jean. Oh, Billy Jean ACL. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes, you're good. Okay, uh, do we have Billy Jean? Yes, my name is Billy Jean, and I live Billy Jean Claiborne, and my address is 285 Southwest Third Avenue. I'm the yellow house in front of the apartments. Um, I am opposed to this as well. I am thinking about my high schooler going to school. This road is heavy with high schoolers. Um, I don't know if there was 12 or 24 parking spots, but if every unit has, if every two bedroom unit has two cars, we're looking at 12 cars. One unit, one bedroom units would have one car. So we have there alone 18 cars. My, the front of my drive, the front of my house will be lined with cars. 
I feel like that is putting our high schoolers in jeopardy. Um, the spacing between the car that's parked on my side of the street and on the other side of the street, that is way too close. Um, yeah, I, I'm just opposed to this. This isn't part of, it doesn't really go into this neighborhood, I feel. Okay. Well, thank you for, I appreciate you taking your time um, and testifying. It's really encouraging. I, I love to see uh, people coming out and saying their piece. Jason, who do we have next? Uh, Mark Wild. And I just want to apologize to folks in advance. I have a thing. I'm horrible at reading names. So, Billy Jean, I apologize for butchering that so bad. <laughs> Mark is the applicant. I think okay. all of the uh, opponents have spoken. Okay, yeah, because then I've just got Jonathan Clayton and Jeannie Driscoll. They've all spoken. Okay. Then okay. that was all I had. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have uh, the applicant has 10 minutes for rebuttal. Oh, okay, this is Mark again. So first of all, I wanted to thank all of the neighbors for taking the time to show up tonight and voice their concerns. Um, I'll speak on behalf of State Street Homes. We always take these concerns uh, seriously and we do understand that any development, new development, especially multifamily development does bring impact to a neighborhood and it's not hard for us to understand or imagine where that would, um, that kind of change would, would bring some stress and frustration for the neighbors. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and speak to a few of the points that were made. There's not going to be enough time for me to address everything, but I did make some notes. Um, before I do that, again, I just wanted to uh, reiterate, we worked really hard to make sure that we proposed a project that fell within the zoning code. We're not asking for adjustments to any of the code. We're not asking for, um, uh, for any variances. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and j just quickly respond to a few of the things that I made notes on. Um, Rhonda and Dave spoke of a historic preservation plan. I I'm going to admit I'm not familiar with Canby's historic preservation plan. I'm not sure um, if there's an overlay in the code there that affects the project that we proposed. Um, my guess is no, but um, I would love to learn more about that in the future. Uh, Jonathan Claiborne. Um, spoke about the easement. Uh, he, he owns the home that's in front of our property in our proposed project. And I, I appreciate your concern, Jonathan, about the, uh, the tight nature of that driveway. Um, I, I guess the only the po point I would make is that we this project had already been started and proposed, I think, when you purchased that property. And I believe you were pretty aware of that easement in place. And so, um, again, I, I don't... I don't state that to be insensitive to the concern, um, just that I'm surprised that, um, that you would move forward with a purchase on a property if that easement was in place. Um, and, and I do have some empathy if you were unaware of this proposed project when you purchased that. Uh, I'm gonna move on to Ginny's testimony. Um, had mentioned some concerns about the AC spacing and I believe we are providing uh, the spacing that would be required for the AC where our fence goes. Um, there was some, some mention about the traffic concern. And again, that's why we went ahead and employed DKS. That was not a requirement of this application. City Canby Code does not require that we did a traffic study for this type of project, but we did do that uh, for our own education. We spent money on that in time and, and uh, to make sure that we weren't a high impact on in the neighborhood. And, and when you read that report, it does appear that DKS agrees that this proposed project does not highly impact the neighborhood uh, or, or specifically that street. Um, uh, also, I think Jenny talked about the porch and balconies don't count towards the outdoor area and that is not our understanding, um, but we'll defer to uh, Eric and his team to to get back to us on that if, if we need to make any changes for that out required recreational area. Let's see, uh, I think it was Maria mentioned some min minimum density versus maximum density. And I just wanted to remind the commission and um, all the neighbors that again, we, this project does fall inside 
of the minimum and maximum density range for the R2 zoning. Um, and the 14 units meets the criteria for the 0.44 uh, acre that we own. Um, let's see, moving on to uh, Patsy, I think, again, was some more concern about the space between the driveways. I think we did cover that, that we are meeting the criteria for the space between the driveways. And I don't know if it got mentioned, but we do plan to add a fence also between the two driveway areas to, to give some privacy for the driveways as well as the house facing that part. Uh, let's see, Karen talked about the parking and some concerns about the parking on the street. Um, and I think there was also, Billy Jean mentioned that as well. And I just wanted to remind everyone that we are proposing 18 parking spaces on our site, not including any street parking. So that provides for one and a half parking spaces per unit that we're proposing, which is, which is actually considering statewide and some of the other communities we work in is, is a pretty liberal amount of on-site parking. Um, many jurisdictions and zonings require one per unit or less. And so there's a lot of debate in, in neighborhoods between neighborhoods and city governments and developers on how many cars people own. It's a really, it's a really difficult conversation to have because each community is different. Each socioeconomic uh, makeup is different on vehicle ownership, but this by far uh, supersedes the average of what, at least what we've experienced that, uh, that folks own for vehicles. Um, that, that, needless to say, there, there obviously there will be situations in which I'm sure our tenants park on the street, but I, I feel that this is a, a pretty liberal amount of parking for on-site to really mitigate that impact on the neighborhood and the, and the local streets. Um, and then I think it was Sandra, hopefully I remember that name correctly, um, just had some concerns about the fencing and, and the viability of the fencing that we're gonna build. Um, we, we build very high quality fencing. We use pressure treated posts, they're set in concrete. We use cedar and other outdoor uh, viable materials. Our fence would not fail within a couple of years. Our, our fences would last decades. And because we're gonna maintain over an ownership of this property, we're not building this property to sell to another user. Uh, it, it further motivates us to keep up things like that. Because again, we want to keep a beautiful property and beautiful surroundings, not only for our tenants, but also for the neighbors. I think it's, I think I wanted to mention that it's really important that we continue and maintain good relationships with our neighbors is we're going to own this property for a long, long time. We have no intention of building this to sell. We, we, uh, we look forward to owning this property in the city of Canby and being part of the growth of the city for a long, long time. And uh, that's uh, that's that's really it for all my responses. Again, I just wanted to thank the neighbors for speaking up, and, and we appreciate their concerns, and um, we appreciate again the commission for hearing this project. Thank you very much. And uh, at this time, I will close the the public uh, hearing portion of this meeting and move to the commissioners. If you have any questions. Um, We'll start with uh, Commissioner Mills. No questions at this time, Mr. Chair. I will have some comments uh, about how I feel about voting on this. I guess one okay. question that I have, what, I do have one question that pops into my mind. I've raised the question about whether we will have wh where the conditions of approval are and how can we see them so we know what we're voting on. Okay. That's all I've got for questions. Commissioner Mills, this is Eric. Can you hear me? I'm not sure why there are, when the packet was posted, I'm almost certain the staff report was in there, but I have the conditions of approval in front of me on this screen. Um, are you talking the May 10 staff report? Yes. Do you have a page number? Uh, 40, look, the blue numbers, it's going to be 42 through 45. Okay. With the blue numbers. There they are. Yep. There they are. Yep. Just as you said, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want I've to been looking back for them and I scrolled back. I must have scrolled by them a half a dozen times. Thank you. Do you want me to come back to you later on, Jeff? 
Uh, I'm going to have some comments uh, about why I vote the way I vote. Uh, okay. So, but I think uh, I probably should move on for now. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Trendy, do you have any questions? Sorry, it was not unmuting. Um, yeah, I just want to confirm that I understand the zoning properly since it was brought up. Um, my understanding, if I can get this page to open, is that the R2 zoning um, is uh, new development shall achieve a minimum density of 14 units per acre. Um, and I think the concern was, and perhaps was a misreading of the code, um, is that they're saying there's 12 that's going on 0.44 acres, um, but it's, it's a minimum of 14 units per acre, not a maximum. And I wanna clarify that I'm understanding that correctly. And um, to also clarify that that was, that I understood the, um, the person who was uh, commenting about that, that were addressing their, their uh, concerns there. Um, so it said it's a minimum of 14 units per acre. Is that correct, Eric? That's correct. Okay, so that the 12 on 0.44 is within the code. Yep, that exceeds the minimum. Thank you. I just wanted to confirm that I was understanding both sides of that. Yeah, and there is no numbered maximum, but uh, way back in the beginning of my staff report, the setbacks, um, impervious surfacing, parking, and other standards is kind of the way the maximum works. That makes sense. Right. And where can you tell us what the maximum would be based on that? Uh, I wouldn't be able to give you a number right off the top of my head, but um, they're pretty close to probably the maximum. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, any other questions, uh, Commissioner? Yeah. Oh. No, I, that's all I had. I just wanted to confirm that okay. I was understanding both the um, citizen's question and the reading of the code. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Patton, do you have any uh, questions? I do, um, and then I'll have some comments uh, when we vote. Uh, I want to just check with Mark, the applicant. Was a letter sent to all of the neighbors and residents that would be around this development or within a certain radius of this development to get their input uh, in advance? Uh, yeah, there was. So we send a letter to, a, I think it's a radius 500 feet, if I believe correctly, as part of our pre-application. Um, and then I, I also believe that staff, it does a separate neighbor notification, if I remember correctly. And I know that COVID screws everything up, but was there uh, like a Zoom meeting or something uh, offered for people to uh, testify in person or air their grievances uh for or against this this development? Yes, we did. We had a separate Zoom meeting where we uh, spoke with some of these neighbors previously and listened to their testimony. And there were there there uh, there were attendees to that. There were, and in fact, that was one of the reasons that we um, uh, requested a continuance with some from that testimony and some of the concerns about traffic. That's why we went ahead and made the decision to go back to DKS and get the traffic study so that we could help um, address some of those concerns as well as I think we make some adjustments to our privacy plantings and such. So yes, we okay. th that was actually a very productive meeting. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. That's all yeah. I had. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Penn. Uh, Commissioner Heath, do you have any questions? Yeah, there. Uh, you know, there you are. Can you hear me? You bet. All right. Yeah. So I, I'm looking at, uh, it looked like, uh, an attachment Regina Taylor, uh, forwarded and I verified it. Uh, the can be, be, uh, can be access limitations, project density changes. It was chapter 16.46.03. It, uh, 
yeah, it says the number of, uh, yeah, it says that, yeah, there needs to be 10 feet between driveways. And so if that is valid and up to date, it looks like it was made in uh, 2019. So it, it looks pretty current. They, there wouldn't be 10 feet between these driveways. And so that would be a variance uh, as far as I'm understanding it. Uh, maybe Eric, uh, you could address that because I'm not convinced that, you're, that this is meeting code according to this, this table. Uh, yeah, give me one second, please. Which section did you say? It's uh, to see what her exact comments say. Well, it was a, uh, there's a table. <laughs> when I looked it up, uh, I just checked to make sure it was up to date. There's a table uh, in there and it, like it says, uh, access management guidelines for city streets and neighborhood and local streets. If you go to the right, it says minimum spacing driveway to driveway and it says 10 feet. And and Eric, that comment, um, Commissioner Heave is stating, that's for neighborhood and local access and not driveways. Yeah, that's and that's my understanding. I just wanted to see what Regina uh, was saying specifically. And and again, that's is that largely will be addressed with that five foot curb cut separation with the private driveways. This isn't this isn't a public road. Okay. but that would apply to okay okay i gotta jump in here this is commissioner boatwright yes commissioner boatwright i'm looking at that table too and it does say neighborhood local but it says where it's a minimum spacing driveway to driveway 10 feet it says exceptions may be made in the downtown commercial district, if approved by the city engineering or public works department, where alleys and historic street grids do not conform to access spacing standards. Measured center line on both sides of the street. That's because it has our, you know, uh, maximum spacing for roadways, minimum spacing, minimum spacing on roadways to driveways. Uh, private access to arterial roadway, roadways shall only be granted through a requested variance of access spacing policies when access to a lower classification facility is not feasible, which shall include an access management plan, management plan evaluation. Uh, not applicable for single family residential driveways this says refer to section 1610.070B in parentheses, 10 in parentheses. It says spacing shall be measured between access points on both sides of the street. I don't know if that means anything, but that's, that's where Commissioner Heeb is getting his information. And that's what I was referring to as well when I was talking about the 10 no way that could be there could be 10 feet 
between those driveways. Thank you. Um, I did see that code as portion as well. It also does then refer you to um, basically the city may require then an applicant to provide an engineer traffic study, access management plan, or other information is needed to demonstrate that the roadway will operate within the acceptable standards with restricted access in place. 6046, right after the access management. Um, again, this was a big part of why uh, we asked DKS to look at the access with a primary focus, not so much on the traffic generation itself, but the safety components of the access. They came back and told us that we wanted, they, we absolutely need to see that there's that five foot separation and curb cut approach from the nest, the adjacent driveway. Um, that's, I, that is staff's position that that is an acceptable distance to provide safe access. That's what DKS told us. Uh, this is Commissioner Boatwright again. Okay. If you, uh, DKS also said there was 50 feet to the to the east and 10 feet between driveways to the west, and that's wrong. I think the 50 feet is to the center line of Grant Street. Is that what you're talking? Is that what you were mentioning, Commissioner Boat? Right. Well, it was talking east and west of the prop property to the east, and then it said property to the west, and it's in it, uh, and it said, I forget exactly what it said, but it referred like when it said east and west. And it, it measured out 10, they said 50 feet on one side and 10 feet on the other side. And I think they said uh, east and west respectively. In other words, they were saying there was 10 feet distance on the western side and there would be 50 feet on the eastern side. And I thought it meant to driveways. I'm positive on the western side, that's what they were talking about. And I... Um I imagine they're measuring from center lines. They use the same methods that um, I think uh, Jennifer Driscoll had mentioned. They look at some of the street imagery and then where the proposed access lands itself. Um, they're calling the 50 feet separation from South Grant, which is probably the principal concern um, with that adjacent intersection that's sufficient. And then that five feet curb cut separation as necessary in order to provide safe ingress and egress from the property. Does that answer your concern, uh, Commissioner Boatwright? Uh, well, if, if I if they're measuring center line to center line, I'm sure it would be 10 feet, but um, I'm just not sure about that. It doesn't make sense to me because it says 10 feet on the 10 feet separation on that chart. <clears throat> and there's no way there's 10 feet separation, even with the five foot uh, curb type thing that only i guess that you know i mean if the driveway is going to run right down the property line anyway but i'm just saying that that unless there's a different code for r2 division to r2 zones from what we're reading this code here does that make sense jeff <laughs> I'm asking uh, you because you're the thinker in the group here. <laughs> no, I think we got plenty of thinkers in this group, uh, including the new guys. Um, I, I'm looking at, and I'm and I'm gonna I'm looking at Eric as I sp speak, but I, I'm looking at this table for neighborhood and local minimum spacing driveway to driveway ten feet. I don't see how we make it. 
I, yeah. I, I haven't seen a graphic that shows that to me. And um, it seems like, and I'm looking for the remedies in the asterisks above. One of them doesn't seem to apply. The other one says it's measured center line on both sides of the street. So that could mean if there's a if there's driveways on both sides of the street within center lines of 10 feet, that's just even more restrictive. So I don't see, we've been talking about an adjacent driveway, which they're going to divide and provide privacy by putting a fence up to make some separation between them. And there, I think we're only talking a matter of a couple of feet. Um, I'm not sure how I see that that makes center line to center line. Uh, Eric, maybe it does, but, and you're telling, if you're telling me it does, I've got doubts, I guess is what I would say. Okay. It's a I little, mean, if, you, if you have a, if you have a 20 foot wide driveway to the apartment complex next, right next to a 10 foot wide driveway to a residence, then the center line to center line is 15 feet, right? Minimum. Uh, uh, we're, we're trying to interpret code here, and it's uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with commissioners inter interpreting code on the fly here. And I feel like uh, maybe we're ignoring something you've told us, and you probably need to thump us on the head a little bit. But <laughs> I'm not I'm not com confident that we've got the 10 foot minimum. I can see how it would happen center line to center line with the two adjacent driveways making a total width together of say 30 feet then center line to center line is 15 and i guess we make it unless there's a unless there's another driveway across the street which i don't know if there is or not so my my opinion of this is that i and i've mentioned this is that i'm i'm relying on dks here to give me what they do this this is their their expertise they seem to think it's fine with the five foot curb cut separation even if that were the 10 foot is somehow not being met i see that an exception could be granted i don't think we can lawfully deny somebody that has an e access easement onto a public road and say that no you can't access a public road from your property that sounds um illegal and um, I don't know. I mean, their exception standard basically points you to do a traffic study and, anal and that, do an analysis on whether that access is going to be safe leaving and entering. And the DKS basically said it looks okay. We, we would want you to put in some pedestrian infrastructure. Hassan, at the, the city engineer consultant, wants a commercial approach and uh, ADA wings and good vision clearance on both sides. And between those two departments or consultants, they seem to think it's okay. So, yeah, okay. Staff's position would I, my position would still be to recommend approval and have that five foot curb cut separation and and grant the access because. Even if with the exception, we were go through an exception process, it basically points you to doing another traffic study. Um, Chair Savory? Yes. Um, I'm actually seeing, um, and I think part of the problem here is that it's, um, there's two different codes, 16.10, covers residential driveways. And that says it needs to be a curb cut has to be five feet from the property line. Um, and, and that's an H, 9H, um, unless it's a shared driveway is installed. And then it also says that deviations may be approved by the city administrator or, or a designee. Uh, multifamily access driveways will be required to meet the same access requirements as commercial driveways if the multifamily site generated 100 or more trips a day. So I'm thinking that what they're looking at is they're combining the 16.10, um, which is on page 12 of the Canby code, with the 16.46 that Commissioner Heeb um, is referencing. So I think that's part of why it's confusing because I think what they probably did and why we hire outside consultants instead of having 
commissioners interpret code is that they look at the code holistically and see where things may or may not um, uh, contradict each other um, and then make their decisions based on that. So I think that what we're doing possibly is snapshotting little pieces of the code and trying to make it fit and trying to um, not go by what the, the professionals that were hired to review the code said, but trying to review it on our own. Um, and I think that's a highway to disaster when we start trying to, you know, on the fly interpret code. Agree. I do agree with that. Yes. So, um, but if I, you know, I hate to miss anybody, you know, on this discussion here. So, um, the, should is, does anybody have any more comments before we move to? uh approve or deny this uh, i'll get them out of the way mr chair okay. um i'm probably going to vote for this with great reservations uh the comments i make are you know we've been talking about minimum uh density at 14 units per acre this development is at 27 units per acre it's nearly double the minimum, and it's sitting in what has traditionally been single family. So I think it's a, a huge overstep of what is meant by the word compatibility with a neighborhood. But I'm not sure that that's enough of a, of a, re, uh, of a basis because it doesn't feel rigorous enough for me to vote against it. So that's where I'm leaning. Um, I, I expect that the people in the neighborhood are unhappy to hear that. And I encourage them to consider an appeal to the city council, the vote, the people they voted for to have another discussion about this. Uh, my words to the developer are, uh, this aesthetic is not good. It's not compatible. Uh, you've overstepped on your density. And if I vote for it, it's by kicking and screaming. So. That's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Um, Commissioner Pad. So, are we doing the comments now, or we have we closed the questions to the applicant? Uh, we have closed questions to the applicant, but I'm I'm pretty liberal on those sorts of things. Jason, okay. So, so, so if you, you go if you want, you can go right ahead. So, for my comments, I just want to say that. You know, I I am not a heartless government person. Uh, I can appreciate where these citizens are coming from. Uh, I wish there, un unfortunately, we do not have a very robust inventory of historically registered houses. So regarding the historic portion of this, in order to really put some teeth into saying that we can't approve this because of this historic home, those houses have to be registered as historic homes. When they are not registered as historic homes, they are like any other building in the city and, and fall under those purviews. So my plea to people who, at, who have historic homes in the city is to work to get them registered so that they will be saved. Um, I am a huge proponent of saving the history of our city. Um, one of the point, one of the other things that was mentioned was, and this is just an educational aspect for folks. We are not voted into these positions. We are appointed as commissioners to this body by the city council. We apply, we interview, and then the city council has the ability to either approve that appointment or not. And so I just want to make sure that folks understand that, you know, we we have not been voted into these positions. The city council has determined that we we either a we're willing to throw ourselves on this pike for the city um, or that, you know, we we have an interest in participating in being a, a, a part of making sure that the city stays on track. 
Um, and this is something that I learned uh, in our previous thing, and this is for folks to understand that, you know, we are bound by many laws within both the city and the state that when certain applications meet the boxes and meet the requirements, if we approve, if we disapprove them because we don't like the way they look or something along those lines, it opens up a humongous can of worms uh, legally for the city. And we have to take that into consideration. Um, <clears throat> as far as the drive driveway thing, I'm almost scared to mention this. I, I have to believe that there is lenience uh, as far as the space between driveways. My neighbor's flag lot driveway and mine, you know, if I didn't make my driveway a different color, they would all look the same. Uh, there's no fence. There's nothing delineating them. So I have to believe that there is, you know, and, and my driveway isn't the only one in the city that that, that falls into that category. Um, so I, I agree um, with uh, that this building does not fit the aesthetic. This is a very modern looking building. Uh, it does not fit the aesthetic of the home in front of it or the homes around it. But I know that in the future, five, 10, 15 years down the road, that probably most of these houses in this neighborhood will be gone. And they will be, a there will be more apartments in this area. It's just unfortunate that they are going to be put in piecemeal and it's going to make a rat's nest of side streets and flag lots uh, that will not be aesthetically pleasing or to, to the city. And so that is one of my major concerns. But all that being said, uh, I will most likely be, I will be voting to approve this because, you know, other I, I do not feel like landing the city in a, in a lawsuit because I don't like the way the building looks. So that is, that is my opinion. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Pad. Um, Commissioner Heath. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not a huge fan of the project uh, as it's right now and current, I don't know, what it's going to do to the neighbors and what it's going to do to the immediate area. But I don't, I don't see that I have any legal uh, justification to not vote for it. So I, I, I don't see any, uh, any code that, uh, yeah, it will allow me not to vote for it. So, so. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Heap. Uh, Commissioner Boatwright. Yeah, well, I see things a little differently. Um, I don't think it does meet code according to what I'm looking at. And I don't know about the one Jennifer talked about because I don't have it in front of me. And I don't believe that I'm going to leave it up to DK or whatever their name is to interpret code for us or make uh, adjustments for us. I think that's up to us. And I think without a variance or without, uh, yeah, without a variance to that code, I'm going to vote against it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Boatwright. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Commissioner Trendy, did, did you have your opportunity? I, I can't remember. <laughs> no, I was at the end of the question period. So um, I'm in it that, the same thing. At, I don't see code that we can interpret that, um, that we would get deference on and how we review this. Um, if there was a place where we could squeeze it in differently and would get deference from the powers that be above us that review this, um, then I would consider voting against it just because I do feel for the neighbors. Um, but the developer has done his due diligence um, as far as meeting our code. And if we don't like things that are happening in our community, then we need to change our code. Um, and uh, that's, you know, I'm probably going to vote for it, um, you know, with the additional conditions of approval suggested by staff. Okay, thank you. Um, I am, I find myself in, uh, in Commissioner Mills' uh, 
camp there. I'm going to, uh, uh, I, I, I think that it doesn't fit the neighborhood. I think that it's um, uh, a real, a, a kind of an intrusion on the, on the neighbors, but they've checked, the developer has done their due diligence. They've checked all the boxes and I'm, I am going to vote uh, in favor of the project. So I, at this time, I will entertain a motion to um, to approve the um, State Street Multifamily Project uh, DR2104. I move to approve DR2104 with additional conditions of approval of the adjusted approach, the ADA accessible sidewalk, and specific designation of the recreation area on the plan to be submitted to staff. Okay, do I have a second? I can second that. Okay, um, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Real quick, aye. I just have a quick question. It, was, it wasn't mentioned about the fence. We're just taking it that they're going to deal with the fence. I believe the fence was on the plan, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to be sure. Okay. So I, I would encourage the um, developer to maybe talk to the neighbor that's going to have the fence directly facing their front door and see if it can be adjusted for a more aesthetic setback or angle. Yeah, we plan to work with that neighbor, actually with all the neighbors, uh, and we'll run the fence designed by all of them. So all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all opposed? Nay. Uh, ayes have it. And uh, so we have passed DR 21-04. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, Commissioner Trendy, if you could restate that for the final decisions. Sure. Um, we approve BR 21-04 with additional conditions of approval of the adjusted approach, the ADA acceptable sidewalk and pedestrian area, and specific designation of the recreation area on the plan. Uh, all in favor say aye. Oh, I need a second. I'm sorry. I'll second again. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Now, I'm confused on this. I, I mean, it's a final decision. Even though I voted nay, I should vote yay on this one, right? Not necessarily. You no, don't I think okay. Jeff, what do you think? I think you vote your <laughs> I think you vote your conscience. Nay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we also have to um, have a final, I think uh, the final findings for the Canby utility. Uh, BAR 21-03. I move to approve the final findings of um, VR 21-03. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we now will move to uh, items of interest from the planning staff. So... Don, what have you got for us? Um, Commissioner Savory, just um, just a few items um, that we're working on. Um, it's likely that uh, Department of Land Conservation and Development will be providing funding for uh, cities, and we're seeking funding for the housing needs assessment and or analysis, sorry, housing needs analysis and housing production strategy work. And uh, we are seeking, actively seeking, um, uh, grant money from them, and there's a scope of work being prepared that will be submitted at the end of the month. Um, that work probably, if we do receive the funding, will probably start in September of this year. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so our next regularly scheduled meeting is June 28th. Correct. 
Yes, that is correct. correct. Okay. Uh, anything else? Yes, I can, have a uh, question. Oh. Um, so now, I'm sorry. It's um, for staff. So regarding the June 28th meeting and future meetings, we had discussed um, at a previous meeting two weeks ago uh, that we may need to do some additional meetings over the summer. And I'm wondering if that has been determined at all yet. And if we could have a schedule as soon as possible when that happens. Um, Commissioner Trendy, yes. Um, I, I think at this point, we are probably looking at the heavy hearings being um, late summer, fall, rather than um, probably more fall, but we can get back to you on that. Um, at this point, I think there's gonna be a large number we're anticipating uh, probably in September, October, November, more so than July and August. So I don't think we'll need extra hearings in those months, but there, there's a big onslaught of applications coming that um, we're anticipating in that time period between September and November. Okay, um, I hope I'm not out of line in asking that, asking that we have at least 30 days notice for added meetings. Uh, 30, I'm sorry, could you repeat could, that? Could, could we request that we have 30 day notice for added meetings? Yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. No, and it's not a problem. We would I think for hearing we have to anyway, don't we, yeah, for yeah. public hearings? Pretty much almost, yeah. Yep, and I think you know to that extent we need to be proactive and, and that's a really good point. Thank you. You're yeah, and, and if I might just add something, this is Ryan. Um, I, I just wanted to plug the next meeting has two very big items. So um, we do hope that the whole commission can make that uh, meeting. Um, we definitely um, want everyone there for those discussions. Um, and, and it might go late. I just wanted to give everyone a heads up. Okay. Well, thank this you is, so much. This is Jason. I have something. I really think that we need to develop instructions or pre prior to the meeting have step-by-step -step instructions on how people attending the meeting are to put their little, until we are in person, put their little box, their name and what their uh, position is on this because part, part of the reason why it took so long is because we take this shotgun approach with trying to deal with these things and everybody's screen lists the people differently and they move around. And uh, if we're gonna be doing these large things, we have got to come up with a more efficient way to, to work that out. <clears throat> I think using this, the chat would help tremendously um, if there's somebody you know that can co-host so it's not popping on their screen and do it that way, just like you know handing in the little pieces of paper um, or have something where there is an, ab an absolute list ahead of time um just i think that would make a, a huge difference but i appreciate you taking the initiative to write down the list jason yeah, yeah. another yeah, thing that have... would, an, another thing that would make a huge difference is starting to meet in person when is that going to start happening yeah it's, um... there's not an exact answer we are opening our office up three days a week starting june 21st i'm not sure if the council's actually made a decision on reopening for hearings and that they're kind of leading that charge to some degree. Um, I think it is soon uh, to Commissioner Patton's point. I think it is challenging. And I think one thing we could probably do as well better on our staff side is um, when people are uh, saying they're going to want to be participatory in this process is to ask them, are you a proponent or opponent? And therefore we could create a list perhaps in advance. Well, and I just, I just want to, I am all for participation in the community and I just want to make sure that, you know, and unfortunately I'm straddling the fence on this, you know, if someone wants to speak on the fly, that they still have the opportunity to do that. I don't want us to be, I don't want us to say, oh, sorry, you didn't put your name in in advance so you can't speak. That would sit very poorly with me. So I, I want to make sure that there's still that opportunity for, for people to participate. Yeah, I, well, I, agree. I, I, I agree with that. And I've and as most people that know me, 
and have watched watched our commission hearings over the last several years. I'm pretty liberal about letting people speak and say their piece. I want citizens, citizen input is important to me. It's very challenging and very difficult uh, in, in the Zoom platform. In person, what you're saying is easy to do. And um, so, in principle, I, I totally agree. But I, I think that we have some challenges as long as we're meeting like this. Yeah, and I, I have no problem helping out with keeping track of that list. R regarding the chat, um, one of the questions I have is, because these meetings are public record, um, is does the chat run afoul with record keeping? Like, is that chat being downloaded and embedded in the minutes, or how is that working? Because the last thing I would want to have happen is, stuff happening in the chat and then that not being preserved for the public record and then running afoul of public record keeping laws. <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, that, that's, that's a staff that's, question. Yeah. That's a staff question. Yeah. <laughs> generally being um, captured for in terms of like minutes or note keeping. However, the whole meeting itself, the chat window and everything else is recorded. So we have that should you know, okay. that be needed at a later date. Yeah. I'm all about trying to avoid litigation yeah. <laughs> as a member of the, as a co as a, as a member of the, the uh, budget committee, all about stopping litigation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other okay. thing that, that happened is Laney had an emergency. So we kind of had to like, we had a bit of a scramble there that we, I apologize for. I think it would have been a little smoother, but um I think you did a good job, uh, Commissioner Patton. So, yeah, this is a this is a big deal, and uh, and I think we did well. Uh, one thing Commissioner Patton did say was um, something about maybe providing something, maybe some like etiquette or tips for when pe we know people are gonna um, sign on to give comments. Maybe we can develop something that we can transmit to them that kind of gives them a um a primer for for the what the experience will be like once they do log on so we we'll look into that yeah and even if what what i was kind of envisioning is like as the meeting is is gearing up if there's a slide that's up that says if you're attending this meeting please follow these instructions to sure. uh change the name your name in the box that displays on the screen something along those lines have them fairly detailed so that way uh, people can can try and do that. <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think that's a great idea. Every once in a while I come up with one, but you know, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta catch them when they come. <laughs> okay, so uh, unless there are further comments uh, or interesting discussions, uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Do I have a second? Seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank, thank you one and all for, for uh, being here this evening and have uh, a pleasant week. Talk, see you in about two weeks. Thank you.